Jagdish only, Mr. Shankar's slides have to be shared. So in case, uh, keep them in backup. Okay, sir. Yeah, all the other slides have given in case they have issues. But uh, Shankar slides uh, most probably we only have to share. So if Anansa doesn't share, you can click and start sharing. Okay, sir. All right, just keep all the slides with you in the backup. No, okay. And I will make you the host and I'll leave. Okay. Okay, sir. Host list, sir. That's what the whole list which have, uh, which has been given. I'll send the list again. The full advertisement which is there. I'll send it earlier. I'll send it again. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, uh, Jagdish, uh, out of this, uh, Captain Suri Pullat, uh, Captain Kamal Chadda, and Captain uh, Venkat, they three have to be made co hosts. Okay, sir. And all the, the list are shared in the group. All the others, you can make them the co hosts. As soon as they finish speaking, you can remove the co host uh, permissions. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, all right. Yeah, but uh, Captain Kamal Chadda, Captain Pullat, and uh, yeah, and Captain Venkat can be kept co hosts for the whole meeting. Okay, okay, sir. Good morning, Captain Anand. Good morning. Hi, good morning, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, could you rename yourself, please? Yeah. Yes.
so yes sir so most probably only uh, shankar sir's uh, slides have to be shared in the group it's been mentioned so yes correct you correct. could uh, share it's that in, in. It's, it's in pdf so yeah, yeah you could share that and yes. uh, jagdish will be in your backup fine fine perfect, perfect. and in the second session couple of them have given but i'll just keep it aside yeah we'll keep it as a backup and i have told jagdish to handle the spotlighting muting and all only uh, powerpoint sharing you could uh, look into sure 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 yeah good morning can this photograph is not uh, i think start video is not working is it disabled no it's not disabled no it's not working Anand, I think there is something wrong. I think. Yeah. Okay. Now logo is coming, but then Anand, can you switch off, switch on your video? Just see because I am not able to switch off. Uh, switch on the video. Are you able to switch off your video? Yeah. Switch it on. Okay. That means my setting some issue is there. I am not able to switch on the video at all. Okay. Jati, 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 Rukum. Okay. I'll check with Kirpal. I switched left and came back, but still I'm not able to switch on the video. I'll ask Jagdish also to check. Jagdish, one more video on Pani Paru. Ah, where is it? Okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine, fine. जगदीश मीटिंग I was unable to unmute there. So, okay. Ah.
Hello, sir. Captain Mangat, sir, also joined. I will admit him, sir. Yes, sir. I just good morning, sir. Anyway, it just started, sir. I am there actually. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Yes. Okay, but the link is correct. Link is correct. Fine, perfect. I think Captain Vivekananda also joined. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Can we allow all the participants inside? We have fourteen people waiting. Good morning, Donny. They will let you in. Uh, they are joining one by one. Uh, so, yeah, it, it has been given. Oh, oh, now I don't know whether it's late. Anyway, Venkat will look after that. You are in second session. Yeah, very good. Okay, thanks. Morning, everyone. Morning, Shuri. Good morning. Good morning. I, I know some uh, comments or. Oh. You can, some people are saying the host will let you in. They are all waiting. Yes, sir. I asked you for permission in the group. Can I let everyone in? Yeah, everyone? yeah. Please, please. No problem. Because some are coming early. They are worried. All right, sir. Let everyone inside the meeting. Kirtan, can I keep two on the mobile as well as laptop or better not do? You can, sir. But you can mute one of the mics so that the echoing does not happen. Oh, it will echo or something. Yeah, it has happened before. Okay. Thanks, uh, Kirtan. You are going to be there? Yes, I'll be in the background along with Captain Anand. Okay, only the slides, you know, some people have come last minute and uh, they always, <laughs> this happens. So, uh, we can't help it. Anand, good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Hi, Vivek. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Ajay, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning, morning. everyone. Namaskaram. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Everybody is coming one by one. Good, good morning, morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Jagdeen. Hi, Good morning, sir. Hi, Sanjeev. Good morning, everybody. This is Jagan. Jagan. Okay, I don't think uh, we got anything to worry. It's well organized, time management, mic management. As long as we stick to that, of course, things can go wrong. Then we'll see. We'll play the game as it happens. Anyway, being a Saturday morning, I have not put on my tie or jacket. I hope nobody is really. <laughs> Good morning, Pulat. Good morning, Venkat. I am coming in and uh, going out. Be back, Pulat. Okay, Shankar. Yeah, no problem. Come back soon. Yeah, okay. Yeah, looks like someone is sharing the screen. Okay, what happened? My screen went off somewhere else. Uh, you'll have to get out of that. Otherwise, it will be seen by all of us now. <laughs> I caught on us. I'm not changing no, any something. Anyway, 24, in, honor, 24 in honor to some some people being even in jacket, let me put on my tie. I won't put on the <laughs> jacket. <laughs> Captain Suresh, Namaskaram. Good to see you after a long time. How are you, Commodore? Long time. Namaskaram. <laughs> yes, long time. How are you? Uh, all good. Good to see Thanks you all. To see you. At least we're meeting virtually, if not in face to face. <laughs> True. None yeah. of it getting any younger. Huh? How are you? All well, sir. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. Good to see you. Hong Kong will more or less settle now uh, on a daily, on as far as daily life is concerned. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been like this uh, for many months now. So as far as COVID is concerned, but we have other issues, which I don't want to speak. <laughs> yeah, good morning, Commodore Donny. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us and participating in our program. Welcome. Hi, Donny. Good morning. 
Uh, Donny, you are muted. You can say hi and again mute back. Hello, sir. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you so much, sir. You're looking good. <laughs> That's <laughs> the only thing we can do during COVID. Uh, thank you so much. I have to see Morning, Pallad. Morning, Suresh. Good morning. Morning, Sarup. Morning, Kamada Vastan. How are you, sir? Good to see you again. Oh, thanks, Pallad. Uh, morning, Kamada Vastan. How are you, sir? Uh, good morning. Good morning. We had Captain Bangara yesterday with us for another search and rescue presentation, co ports, coastal security, etc. Sir, finally, government is spending money on Navy, huh? Commander Vasan Sir, very nice to hear about this. Ah, uh, no, it's been long pending, so it was good to see yeah, some yeah, of these reports. Pending. Very long pending. Yeah, correct. So, even in the case of Air Force, the fact that they cleared the 83 Tejas, these are good signs, but we need to sustain it. So everybody knows the mic rotation. Kamal, you are in charge of time. We don't want to cut off anybody if they are speaking well. But at the same time, we are, don't have extendable time limits. I put 70 minutes each session. Of course, you know, it can go to 90 minutes. So we'll be here for three hours, which means 12.30, in between a coffee or water break if you want. So I think it's, it's well organized as it can be. But we may have you know, any kind of problem, including technical hitch or whatever. So let's do our best. Yeah, good, Captain Pulat. You've been uh, doing a lot of hard work, I see. You know, working very hard, sending out messages to everybody. You know, taking well, charge of the event. Good show. Harder, he's working hard, but he's driving all of us harder. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, the only way he can be comfortable. You know, something I learned, Donny, it's, uh, it's we are three-year-old and few of us started this. And first thing we did is to put the money where our mouth is. And uh, now it's three years plus, and uh, we got 50 people behind us. That's good. And it shows commitment. And what it shows is uh, to lead you to work hard and make the people behind you work harder. I think uh, Mr. Hazara will agree because he has led a team. You have to work hard and make the others work harder. There's no alternative. That's the only way to show commitment. Thank you. Yeah, as long as you don't work hardly. <laughs> <laughs> No, sir, these are all uh, this is labor of love because we are uh, doing what we like to do and what we are uh, obviously considering important, um, you know, and therefore uh, worthwhile uh, for us to spend our time and energy. Hello. And that's the reason why this is done with some enthusiasm, so much enthusiasm. Good morning, Admiral Kapil. Uh, sir, good morning to you, Captain Pollard. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I am Admiral Kapil Gupta. Uh, retired good from morning. the community. morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning, sir. A special welcome to Rear Admiral Kapil Gupta and to Inspector General Donny. I think you're coming on our program for the first time. So let me also welcome you. Uh, <laughs> Captain Pulat has already warned that the mic time will be very strict. So I'm squeezing in my word of welcome now before uh, <laughs> before the actual formal program takes over. But we are very happy to see you, sir. Thank you so much. No worries, Suresh. We still got four minutes. Three minutes. All right, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 39 participants already. This is very good. Good to see Captain Vekon in full suit. Uh, as always. <laughs> yeah. I'm, no, sure I mean, they, I'm sure you are sitting in an air-conditioned room in Chennai. Yes. <laughs> there, is, there used to be a joke when I was in SCI that almost nobody has seen me without a jacket and a tie. But now, of course, I have changed my habits substantially. Today I saw a lot of people in jackets, so I at least put on my tie. I didn't bother to put on my jacket because I am not in an air-conditioned environment. So no point in sweating a lot. Yeah, tie is a very good substitute in this weather. It's fine. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning, morning. Good morning, morning. Hi, morning, Narsimha. Oh, how are you? 
Very well. Long time no see. <laughs> well, Narasimha is our man in Hong Kong, so you can be uh, assured that we are represented all over. Of course, Jagmeet is. You are you're represented twice, actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very nice to see this international uh, participation. And Ravi Datta is now in Thailand, and uh, we have a lot of other people from overseas as well. Morning, Nurse Simon. How are good, you? Good morning, sir. How are you? Fine, thank you. Your family is still back in India, I reckon. <laughs> That's right, sir. Yeah. Uh, morning, Mr. Nurse Simon. What did you see from Hong Kong? How was it yesterday? Uh... Oh, okay. Are you asking about uh, yeah, no, no, Square? Uh, yeah, I think it it was uh, uh, what to say. It was an on event. There were okay. people who had congregated, but it was more of an on event. Yeah, I thought so because I believe they had deployed some seven thousand uh, policemen all over. Correct. Yeah, dear people did try. The the youth did try, but yeah. then uh, the clampdown or the preparations were much stronger. They are not going to let it happen. It's very simple. They also augmented the law, so it makes it easier for them to control. Yes. Well, just to mention, Imam Farhat, our man is in U.S. Eastern Time. He's sleeping. It's midnight, but he'll join us uh, after hour and a half. So he'll wake up himself, and he's got a very important presentation to make in the second session. So if he doesn't wake up, we'll have to wake him up. <laughs> oh, he's committed. He's committed. He Well, right on dot, we have hit fifty plus. Okay, let's start, Vivek. Okay. Get a show on the road. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this Saturday morning here in India. Welcome to this webinar organized by the Association of Maritime International Commercial Interests and Expertise, MSE for short. The acronym MSE was drawn from the Latin words amicus care, which means a friend of the court, someone who assists the court by offering information, expertise, or insight that has a bearing on the issues of the case. Amici was established three years ago and is a registered society of around 50 senior professionals across the world. The last Amici webinar was recently held on marine pollution regulations. The next webinar would be focused on mariners' welfare. The first out-of-the-box topic for today is the mobilization of a reserve Indian fleet for embargoes and wars in the foreseeable future. To draw a parallel for such a need, let me briefly take you back to the year 1982, the Falklands War between Argentina and the UK. Overnight, UK mobilized a task force of 127 ships, including 43 ships of the Royal Navy, 22 of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and 62 merchant ships. The cruise liners QE2 and the Canberra were part of the merchant fleet and were used as troop carriers. 
they sail 8000 miles from the uk to the falklands the rest is history uk won the war the united states navy maintains a number of ships as part of a reserve fleet often called the moth ball fleet the basic requirements are constant keep the ships afloat and sufficiently working as to be reactivated quickly in an emergency the usual fate of ships in the reserve fleet though is to become too old and obsolete to be of any use at which point they are sold for scrapping or are scuttled in weapons tests given this scenario how do we address this problem here in indian waters with our merchant navy being considered as a second line of defense to present their views we have some eminent speakers who will be introduced as we go along. So please sit back and enjoy the webinar. Over to Captain Puller, please. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, let me make it short because I'm coming back for panel review. But let me set the trend by saying that we are trying to influence government policies. At the same time, let's be very clear that government policies work on socio-economic, political, vote bank issues. We may be politically and professionally correct, but that doesn't mean we get heard. So we need pressure groups. We need to be heard with good intent. That is what we are doing as a professional group. Not that other groups are not there. There are Navy, Coast Guard, and many other committees or subcommittees. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work. So let me put a caveat. All of us are free to speak. If we do happen to trample on others' toes, it is not intention, but the toes are there. So as we pass by, we may trample. The intent is not that, to hurt any egos or power centers or anything like that. We as citizens, apart from giving a vote once in five years, I elect and then the government is run by bureaucrats. It doesn't seem to work the best way we think it should, or at least we are pointing out deficiencies and lacunae which need further attention. So let's put our heads together. Don't feel reserved too much. At the same time, be careful with your language. Uh, we will discuss all that follows in panel summary and make sure this is submitted to government properly to all people concerned. And I'm sure there are experienced people here knowing how well to handle this. Vivek, that's it from me. You can invite the next speaker, first speaker. Vivek, your mic is not on. Anand. Uh. Speaker for today is Commodore R.S. Vasan. Commodore Vasan is an alumnus of the Defense Services Staff College and College of Naval Welfare and Warfare. He has had a distinguished service of over 34 years in the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard. His appointments include command of warships, two naval air stations, and a long-range maritime air squadron. His shore appointments include Chief Staff Officer Operations and Regional Commander, Coast Guard Region East. He is currently serving as the head of strategy and security studies at the Center for Asia Studies, Chennai. He was also the chairman of the Aeronautical Society of India and president of the Navy Foundation in Chennai. Commander Vasan, please. Uh, thank you, Captain Vivek Anand. Uh, very good morning to all of you. It's always a great pleasure being back with the sailing community, the seafarers. And when Captain Pulat uh, spoke to me, have you known for some time and uh, the topic was very very interesting but i am the wrong speaker if you are trying to make a case for raising a auxiliary fleet so you know uh, let me justify thereafter as to why i say this so you know the intention is not to throw a wet blanket but to look at the harsh realities of what we need to do uh, i do have few slides i'll try and share it from here uh, if it doesn't work the slides are not important mm -hmm.
Has it come up? Yes. Good. <clears throat> okay, now uh, this is what I would like to talk about, the Reserve Indian Fleet, Merchant Navy as Second Line of Defense, challenges and opportunities. That's the way I would like to look at it. I think uh, Captain Vivekanand has already set the ball rolling by bringing in the example of Falklands. I will also cover part of it a little later. And also the present state of uh, the Sea Lift Command in USA, and also the RFAs in UK, of which I will talk about a little later. And then bring it to the, the kind of relevance that is required uh, for uh, examining the very issue of what is required in India to meet our uh, strategic and uh, military challenges. So, you know, I'm happy that Captain Vivekanand mentioned the RFA. Here are some diagrams that tell you. You can look at the distance that was there from UK all the way to the, the Falklands. The Falklands was taken overnight. And, you know, the kind of uh, mobilization that was done under uh, Margaret Thatcher is something that history has not seen. So, you know, the auxiliaries, the, uh, the new concept of STUFT, stuffed, that is ships taken up from trade, conversion of existing uh, vessels, all this helped in coming to a midpoint, which is the Ascension Island, which is also just halfway through. And thereafter, to mount this offensive to reclaim the island. It's something which is recorded. A lot of details are available. I'm not going to go into these details. The idea is to tell you that a determined nation, with the help of the Navy, with the help of the Merchant Navy, can achieve its strategic objective. Now, here are some pictures of, uh, you know, what all is the concept. The concept is to convert a Merchant Navy, take it up, spend some money, make it as a row vehicle, convert it into a helicopter carrying deck. In the case of Falklands, they also carried some of the ships to carry the Harriers and operate the Harriers. Because the advantage of the Harrier was it's a jump jet, that means it's a short takeoff and vertical landing. In this case, they were required to take off vertically and land vertically, and therefore the payload limitations were there. But what you see bottom, at the bottom is the Roro, used after conversion of Argus, which is also used in the uh, Iraq war as a hospital ship. So there are plentiful opportunities the moment you have total control of how you want to go about the conversion and keep it ready to be used in times of war. So this is the contender Bazant in 1995. UK government spent uh, 13 million pounds for making it as an aviation training ship. So it's not that they just stopped with uh, the Falklands and they realized that here is perhaps a cost-effective solution instead of using a huge carrier like Virat or Vikramaditya as well use something for training, initial training, particularly for helicopters and jump jets, so that the cost of training is brought down. So I'm just giving you all these examples to tell you how the concepts have evolved over the period of years. Now you can see the number of uh, aircraft which are uh, taken all the way from Ascension Island all the way to for clients and launch them. It is just something that is phenomenal that has been achieved by uh, Falklands because they did have two aircraft carriers, but the additional reserve aircraft that were required additional helicopters that were required could not have been taken but for this conversion which was done in a, such an imaginative manner this is atlantic conveyor unfortunately you know this went down to uh, an attack by two exocet uh, 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 missiles which, which the atlantic air force launched on them and uh, you know here is a board of inquiry this is recent in fact, the complete report on this was updated in 2020, just last, last year. So this was what the uh, time uh, the Board of Inquiry report said, that the helicopter carrying merchant ship that sank with the loss of 12 men, he was hit by two exocet missiles in 82 Falklands, was unarmed, please note all this, unprotected, because Modi lawyers feared that it was illegal to commercial vessels with weapon systems. That means illegal to fit commercial vessels with weapon systems and according to newly released classified documents. So this was released uh, sometime last year after the mandatory number of years when it remains classified. What no, the what reason I want to highlight this is that it's all right to say that we'll equip them, we'll put uh, merchant navy officers and sailors there, they'll sell them. But what are the legal provisions? So you've got to be careful about what the legal provisions are before you commit them to war. In support roles, as an independent merchant navy, which is unarmed, the issue is very different. But even unarmed ships did not have insurance, as we noticed in the Iraq around war. The number of ships that were either hit or sunk is phenomenal. It is not that uh, you know uh, they were innocent vessels. The point is that uh, at a particular stage, the flag of the vessel was changed. Some of them uh, you know, started having the US flag, 
uh, to you know seek an insurance uh, from uh, the ongoing uh, <coughs> missile war. Now this is the Atlantic Causeway. Imagine this is the kind of uh, <coughs> sorry record that they have: four thousand hello landings, five hundred fueling, and two million British pounds was all that was used for conversion. So with that, when you look at the total cost of operation, because a warship is weapon intensive, equipment intensive, and you know manpower intensive. So if you can substitute some of the tasks, peacetime tasks particularly, it, it's a good option to look at. Let's look at this. You know, this is the USA. You know, I think Captain Wakeman also initially mentioned about the uh, the reserves. That's why this is the reserve fleet had 2,277 ships in layup in 1950. Please mark these numbers and how these numbers have come down. In 2003, 274. In July 2007, 230 ships. And in 20, just last year, the number came down to 18. Why? Yeah, you know, of course, here they were all parked in some rivers in Susan Bay and here in California and other places. But the point is that lack of maintenance, natural aging, obsolescence, lack of manpower to uh, you know keep this going. And the effort required to convert it and put it to sea is something phenomenal. And we need to be conscious when we make any such recommendations for having a reserve fleet. So these are the examples which are there: the Sea Lift Command, which is still there, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, which is still there. And but yes, like I said, with a diminished role. And there is some talk in UK of even scrapping this entire concept altogether. So these are some of the mothball ships, as was brought up. This is in California. So the last one which you see on the right. is uh, yeah, i was supposed to that somebody okay. has to switch off his uh, uh, yeah okay now let's come to the last part you know that is just to provoke the audience so that we can have more discussion so what is what is it that we can do in india in the backdrop of some of the things that i want to highlight you know indian jugad is famous so we can beat the british at their own game and atmanirbharata of course has lot of question marks and i always said That we have not gone beyond the first letter A in terms of our atmanir bharata, but that is the way to go in any case. So these are the issues that we must keep in mind because I am the first speaker. So I thought I thought it fit to flag these issues and in the light of what I am going to bring up, then discuss the entire issue. You know, dispassionately. One is of course to understand what is the area of operation for India, which has been identified in the Maritime Doctrine of India. You know, it came out in 2005, then 7, 2009. 2013 and 2015. This has been reviewed. You can have a look at this. So, what is our area of operation? Of course, theoretically, it is from the east coast of Africa all the way to Australia, which covers the Indo-Pacific region. But what is your role there? And what is the cost that if we have to raise a auxiliary fleet that is, you know, standing by for a war that may happen or may not happen? The last major war we fought was 1970. So, from 71, presuming that you had an RFA. Uh, of about let's say even 30 ships what would have happened to those ships how would you have maintained them then of course resources and manpower to maintain this reserve fleet which is this is the example that i told you which is very important that even a big country like usa has brought down those numbers uh, to just about uh, 90 obsolescence of the ships the equipment the, uh, the 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 communication equipment the the navigation equipment the ecds whatever you talk about all this requires constant upgradation time effort money and energy then foundation agreement you know this is something that is important to us we want to extend our range number one we want our fleet to be supported number two we want them to be effective in their operational number three how is this being achieved today we have foundational agreements with usa with singapore and many more are going to be on the pipeline this allows mutual support of ships when they are in operating area beyond the radii of the host country that is i'm talking about india if it is operating beyond let's say in the south china sea for whatever reason theoretically then it needs to be supported so you're going to have those bases open to you you're going to have fuel supplied perhaps from a us auxiliary or from a uk auxiliary or if from a france auxiliary and so therefore these agreements such as the limova would come very handy and so whatever you would like to make in terms of recommendation has to take these factors into consideration then the most important is not uh, sfc it is spc strategic petroleum reserve you know the strategic petroleum reserve i am sure all of you are aware you know in the during the first time of wasp government this decision was taken to ramp ramp up and have 
enough stock of petroleum and crude. So they created a storage of some 5.53 or 5.6, whatever. The figures are available. They're not important. 5.6 million metric tons. Okay. And now their recent decision has been taken to take this up to 15.8 uh, million metric tons. That means the combined capacity of the refineries who have their own fuel and this strategic reserve which has been created in Vishakapatnam, in Udupi, near Udupi and in uh, another place will meet the requirement of the country for 87 days. That's a calculation. It's all there. I know there are no secrets there. So if that is the capability that you have in terms of keeping your refineries going, in terms of the crude requirement that is there, then your requirement now only revolves around supporting the ships which are out at sea in an operational mission. It could be against China, it could be against Pakistan or any other adversary. How are you going to support? Here is where the geographical advantage that India has comes very handy. Look at the Andaman Nicob, strengthen it, keep a lot of reserve there, deploy ships from there, deploy aircraft from there. It increases the range in your areas of interest. Likewise, strengthen Lakshadweep Nicob, which is on the western flank, the southwestern flank. And so these are some of the uh, solutions that are available to India, which is not available to even China, for example. And therefore, this is where we have to now have a five-year plan, augment infrastructure, have storage facilities, and some of the strategic petroleum reserve that I spoke about earlier should be shifted to both Lakshadweep Nikoi and also the Andaman Nicobar, so that you are able to wage war without any hassles and without any worry about, will I run out of my supply? Please remember, this question is not relevant only to oil, petroleum products, water, uh, food, etc. But it's also about the critical war supplies. I'm talking about missiles, of guns, of tanks, of uh, whatever else you require, which is a different, different kettle of fish, which the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, the Army, uh, and, and all know how to handle. That's where they go in for what's called the war waste phase reserve. You know, the war waste phase reserve is a concept where you actually cater for additional equipment to be brought in, bought, procured, catered for. It's almost like the uh, auxiliary reserve fleet which is there. So we have this option of uh, stuff that is ships taken up from trade. We did that during 71. I was there in 71 war. Many of the ships, uh, Captain Vivekan will know, many of the ships were converted. You now, in fact, some of them were fitted with small guns. They also had depth charge rails for uh, self-defense. But the moment you fit a weapon, the legal issues of whether it is an innocent merchant ship or whether it is now uh, a ship that, that can be taken on as a target is something. And particularly when you have uh, <coughs> uh, ambulance ships, uh, you know, and all that, then it becomes even more critical. So we've done this before. We evacuated people from Libya, uh, the war on Libya. Recently, we have again taken people using warships, using Jalashwa. Jalashwa, incidentally, is a Austin class vessel which was mothballed by USA, which we bought. But it has done a great job of evacuating people, you know, from tsunami till till the recent uh, which was there. And SEA, you know, I'm sure all of you have monitored that SEA has already indicated that it's going to uh, sell out the entire government shares. So who's going to manage it? What is the control that you have except to request for the ships or get them? Like even in uh, for evacuation of the ships, we had uh, uh, commissioned two ships, merchant ships for bringing people from Libya and other places. So the Indian Navy and Coast Guard vessels, you know, which are designed are something which is fitted for, fitted with, there are two areas. That is one is fitted with, that means it comes out as a full package, other is fitted for, that means plug and play. In times of emergency, a survey ship can become a hospital ship. It can also become, uh, uh, you know, aviation fuel carrier. It can also uh, carry spares, and also there are other options which are being used for aerial drop of essential supplies, critical supplies, which are not very, very voluminous or very heavy. So these, I thought, were some of the issues that I must identify. Uh, I don't know how much more time I have because I have many more slides and I would not like to show that, except perhaps in the discussion to make my point as and when there is some point that is raised. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Commodore Watson. Um, our next speaker for the, today is uh, Mr. Hajra. Mr. Hajra was the chairman and managing director of the Supreme Government of India. 
He graduated from the University of Calcutta with a B.Sc. Chemistry degree and completed his MBA from Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, before joining the Supreme Government of India. He also completed a degree in law from the University of Calcutta. In addition to his job at SCI, Mr. Hajra has held important positions in industry organizations and institutions such as Indian National Shipping Association, International Shipping Federation, and the World Maritime University. Mr. Hajra, please. Thank you very much, Captain Vivekanand. I also thank my good friend Sudhi Pulat and all other organizers for inviting me, which affords me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with all of you today. First and foremost, uh, I must uh, admit that when Sudhi, he has been in touch for this webinar for a long time, but when he ultimately requested me to deliver a talk, because earlier he said I'll be just a part of a panel, then he said, no, I have to deliver a talk and that too for uh, 15 minutes, a so-called sort of keynote address. I said, look, I will not be able to you know, present slides, PPT, which always becomes handy. As they say, one picture is worth a thousand words. So that will be my limitation. But nevertheless, since you have requested, I, I agree to talk on this subject. Though I must mention that the entire concept of reserve fleet and whatever we call it, as, as already touched very well by Kamura Hassan and Vivekanand also in his opening remarks, they all relate only to defense and to the Navy, uh, naval force rather than to the merchant navy. And we have the concepts, as already mentioned, I will not repeat them of, uh, you know, firstly, UK, followed by USA and even some other countries of the concept of reserve fleet, concept of uh, sea lift command, concept of NDRF, concept of RRF, and so on and so forth. But all these relates to basically, you know, a fleet which is normally mothballed and kept in sort of a readiness that in case there is an war or something, they can be immediately put into action. I will only confine my talk to the relevance of, uh, you know, I would say not exactly reserve fleet, but the relevance of merchant fleet for any nation, particularly for a nation like India. Of course, here again, I will just, uh, just mention that, you know, as an Indian, it always gives me a great pride that we are the only nation in the world after which a notion has been named. And uh, to this very, very August gathering, I don't have to relate anything, uh, you know, relating to the, you know, glorious maritime heritage and past of our nation. But unfortunately, when we look at today, you know, we see not only in various other economic fields, but even in the, you know, in the maritime field, we see that from a very glorious past, we have substantially you know, come down in the sense, let me first mention that at one time, as we know, the Indian GDP was about 20% of world GDP. Today, we are struggling to reach even a 3% mark. And uh, as far as the, you know, maritime fleet is concerned, our rank today has come down to about 16 or thereabout in terms of the, you know, GTE or DWT. But if we look at the world seabone trade, which is about 11 plus billion tons, uh, maybe in 2020, it has slightly gone down because of the pandemic and things like that. But it was at that uh, region of 11 billion plus tons and about 60 plus thousand ton miles in nine, 2019. So if we look at that, then we will see that the Indian exim trade, which is about a billion ton, that's about 10% of the world trade. But if we look at Indian fleet, it's just about 1% that of the international fleet. So there is a huge mismatch because of which every year there is at least about $50 billion being spent towards freight to the foreign lines. Of course, today there the so-called you know, complete self-reliance is just not even envisaged. So obviously there will be definitely foreign tonnage, but whether, you know, our, our share, which was about 40% in the mid eighties, the share of Indian lines, today it has come down to barely 7%. And that 7% is also thanks to the at least crude carriage, 
where crude and product our share is about 12 13% but otherwise if you look at dry bulk if you look at containers uh, scenario it is really pathetic so definitely that is something which we have to look at more because there are number of studies i can only just mention here in the short time uh, one or two of them like the angta study which very clearly established that the countries which have more control on their maritime tonnage for them the incidence of freight to the landed cost either for their import into their own country or for the exports in the foreign countries is always lower for the i mean uh, gross average it is somewhere today i understand about 5 6% but for the developed countries particularly those who control the tonnage like of course you have the you have the, the biggest uh, of course uh, coming from greece then japan then now of course china norway uh, all these countries for them the incidence of freight to the landed cost for either import and export is less whereas for the developing countries it goes up to 8% for india i understand it goes up anywhere between 8 9% at least if not more so that is one secondly there was an insa indian national ship owners association study through teri which also established that for every one dead weight tonnage that is added to the country's fleet there is definitely an economic benefit in terms of gva gross value added for one ton it was calculated somewhere close to 50 dollars in those days and uh, also 1% increase in the indian fleet increases the gdp to the extent of 0.0023% this is of course an old study needs to be updated if you if anyone wants to use this particular model but nevertheless now that our economy is close to 3 trillion dollars 0.0023% if you calculate you will, you will find that's a huge figure and that's a real positive boost to india's gdp coming to certain other other aspects why the national fleet is extremely important and here to some extent at least it is uh, akin to the concept of reserve tonnage that is basically a port tonnage for the nation which can be put into action almost at no notice in case of any war and strife the first aspect i will cover is the maritime security of course commodore vasan is there um, admiral gupta is there i have seen quotations by cns the chief of naval staff not one of them at least three of them who have clearly said that since india is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world in terms of maritime security unfortunately because of our geopolitical situation we serve as our neighbors the best way to improve maritime security is to increase the national tonnage on the indian coast as we all know the foreign ships of course that's a matter of pride i'll mention that in a, or i'll mention it now it's a matter of pride that foreign tonnage has you know a large large percentage of indian seafarers as well as i said some time back the indian tonnage is just about 1% that of the world tonnage but india supplies close to 9 to 10% of seafarers to the global fleet so this is a matter of great pride indian seafarers are considered to be second to none in the world and we take a great pride in that but nevertheless as i was saying the foreign tonnage normally also has lot of foreign crew and as we know it is of course not practical that uh, you know if you if you insist on a foreign ship coming with foreign crew to your your coast and you require the so called security clearance for all those crews it will be absolutely unworkable the entire you know world seaborne trade will come to a grinding halt so obviously that system is not there but here i cannot resist the temptation of mentioning one thing which uh, at least at as the insas level we really pointed out to the the you know the powers to be the government but then nothing nothing was done at one particular time even the indian ship owners despite having such a large you know i mean uh, seafaring community in india did face some shortage particularly for the management level officers as you all know i mean i'm sure all of you do that management level officers the first four that is 
the master, chief engineer, the uh, mate, the chief officer, and the second engineer. So it was suggested that under the Indian Merchant Shipping Act, an Indian ship must necessarily only employ Indian crew, that is officers and, and ratings. So we suggested that there should be some relaxation just like the Indian seafarers can work, of course, on any fleet. Similarly, we should have some relaxation, particularly since at that point of time, there was some shortage. Even that shortage in the management level has always created problem for world ship owners. While there can be a, you know, quite a bit of surplus in the lower ranks, for the upper rank, there is always some, some problem. So the government of India allowed inside that stage, I think, I don't think that is, I mean, that has remained valid, that to two officers, Indian ship can de deploy, provided they are given security clearance. So the whole scheme really fell flat because you know the security clearance, it's time, and then you can't expect a seafarer to wait that long, uh, not, not in employment, but uh, to see whether he gets the security clearance. The whole thing didn't work, but we found it ridiculous that so many foreign crew members are across our coast on the foreign tonnage. And some of those ships have remained on the coast for five, six months at a stretch. Obviously, there cannot be a concept of uh, security clearance. But Indian ships, having so many Indian complements, if they want to deploy just two foreign, foreign uh, you know, uh, officers, they require India, I mean, this security clearance. Anyway, forget that. As I was saying that this is one thing, uh, maritime security, which really improves if you have higher percentage of national tonnage across your coast. The second, which is possibly even more important, it has been touched upon by Commodore Vassar in a different way, is the energy security. You know, when there was some talk, about uh, undersea pipeline for both oil and gas between Qatar, between Oman and India. I have come across statements from the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas saying that this is of strategic interest to the country. So government would like to keep some control on this by having direct stake being held by companies like ONGC and IOC. But it has never ever been really recognized but shipping is nothing but a floating pipeline. So if for the pipeline, you require government control, then why doesn't it apply to shipping? Secondly, as you know, all of you know that for energy security, government has taken a decision of trying to raise India's stake in some of the overseas oil mines, gas, gas uh, fields, etc. Now, unless you have your own tonnage to ensure that in times of war, strife and other, other things, you have the capacity to bring those oil and gas being developed overseas to your own shore. Where is it improving your energy security? And which country other than India can be so very worried about energy security? Because in India, more than 80% of the crude requirement is made through imports. India, as you all know, has emerged as the third largest uh, oil consumer in the world, next only to USA and China. And in terms of import, possibly soon, India will even surpass USA because USA also has emerged to be world's possibly the biggest you know, oil, oil producer. They are producing more than 11 million barrels, barrels, uh, barrels per day. So obviously, India needs this energy security possibly more than most of the other countries. Then, of course, another point which has been touched upon by Commodore Vasan already is the question of, in case of war and strife, the question of the evacuation of Indian citizens who are stranded somewhere where there is a war, war breakout or there are, there are disturbances. Of course, I forgot to mention one more thing as an example why not, while I was talking about energy security. If we go back, not too much, but just about a few decades in the history, in the times of Iran-Iraq war, in the times of Gulf war, and if we study, we'll find that just before the war broke out, 
the Indian tonnage used to carry somewhere only at about 66, 67% of the requirement of the crew to India. During the war and strife, Indian tonnage carried 99% of the crude requirements. If I may say so, it was entirely the Indian tonnage which kept the lifeline of the Indian economy by keeping the oil and products, I mean the crude and products flowing into the country smoothly. I also will just take a, take a few seconds in mentioning that there, were, there was a situation because of the you know, difficulties, one of SCI ship was hit by a missile. There was a situation when the Seafarers Forum went to the extent of thinking of issuing a blanket you know, advice to their members not to go to the Gulf region because of the you know, dangers involved. At that time, to boost the morale of the ship's complements, my predecessor, Sri LMS Rajwar, who is no more, he sailed with a tanker. And these things have not really been publicized ever, but he sailed with a tanker all the way to the Gulf to boost the morale of the seafarers. And these things you can never expect from a foreign operator. This can only be done by Indian operator. So obviously I personally feel, and of course, uh, you know, as I have already mentioned about the economic benefit, you know, uh, a dollar of freight earned by an Indian operator, 67, 70 cents out of that gets plowed back in the Indian economy, whereas barely 10 cents earned by a, a foreign uh, owner and foreign operator out of their dollar of freight earned gets plowed into the Indian economy. As we all know, shipping has a great multiplier effect to the extent of 2.53. So obviously that is a very, very positive thing for the Indian economy as well. If you can increase your tonnage and if you can, you know, I, I'm not saying we can go back to 40% of the carriage today because as we, as I have already mentioned, 1 billion tons of, uh, you know, uh, Indian exim trade, it's a, it's a tall order for the Indian fleet to cater to 40%. But if from the present 7%, we can even raise it to 15%. It will be a great, great boost to the economy. It will greatly improve the energy security, greatly improve the maritime security, and definitely, I think, overall for the nation, which has such a you know, glorious past and heritage, it will be something which everyone should look forward to. I don't think I have too much time left, so I'll stop at this. And during the panel, if there are questions, I'll be very happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hazra. Over to you, Kamal, to introduce Jagmeet. Thank you, Captain Vivekanand. Uh, reading me loud and clear? Yes, very dear. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Jagmeet Makkar. I'm taking his name very informally over here. I'm leaving the mister out. Uh, I know him so well. Uh, Jagmeet Makar is a marine engineer and MSC member, and he is in dispute resolution in a big way. He is chairman of ICS Hong Kong and director Skills Plus. His topic today is control Spanish, focal point of the maritime ecosystem. Please welcome Mr. Jagmeet Makar. Thank you very much, Kamal. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kamal, Captain Pulat, uh, Captain Vivekanan, Mr. Hajra, Commodore Vasan. Thank you very much for making my five minutes so easy for me now. Uh, we have covered almost everything which should have been covered. Thank you so much for that. I'm only going to add on to it uh, from one point that uh, uh, Mr. Hajra mentioned about the multiplier 2.53. Uh, that shows how important the tonnage is. What I am going to talk about it, not just the Indian tonnage, but I want to focus on the Indian controlled tonnage. And we know that the controlled tonnage is essential to build and expand the entire maritime ecosystem around it. And in my humble view, the Indian controlled tonnage may include the national tonnage as we call it, 
the future tonnage in India through uh, the bare boat lease structures, if at all that comes into being, and as well as establishing Indian International Maritime Register, which I am looking at as a second register, not as a, a flag of convenience. There are a few misconceptions, uh, or I would say that misleading perceptions that discourage progress in those areas. Some of these are, I'm going to look at only two of these. Then during panel discussion, maybe, uh, you know, the, the panelists can, can uh, uh, look at it more, uh, you know, expand these further. Ships owned by an Indian or an Indian company, but registered in a foreign country or jurisdiction is Indian controlled tonnage. The fact is no, it is not. It is a flag state that may have the requisition rights on that ship and not India, because it's not Indian flagship. Hence the DG order number 10, dated 23rd of October, 2014, may be reconsidered to help prevent, prevent the tonnage drain, while urgent changes need to be made within India to provide a level playing field to our Indian owners. Second misconception that I normally hear is, that second register is a flag of convenience, similar to Panama, Liberia, et cetera. The fact is, no, it is not. A second register actually is a response of the maritime nations to the flags of convenience. Examples are Marshall Island, which is second register of the United States. Uh, another example of such a maritime nation's response to a flag of convenience is the REG. It's called the Red Ensign Group, which comprises of a family of flags such as Bermuda, uh, British Virgin Islands, BVI, Cayman Islands, Gibraltar, Isle of Man, which is supposed to be right on top of the white list of the port state, uh, United Kingdom, etc. My point is if United States and United Kingdom can take such progressive steps to ensure that they continue to control tonnage, why should we not? Or why can we not? We have large coastal cities and islands which may be used as a family of flags or registers. As I proposed earlier during my discussions or deliberations in the MIV 2013, uh, when we were developing that, we may consider TCG. TCG is the tricolor group which may comprise of say Mumbai, Goa, Pondicherry, Port Blair amongst others, just like the Red Ensign group, the existing Indian tonnage may form part of our tricolor group as the Indian national flag. Each of these registers shall have uniform quality control like you have in the REG, the Red Ensign group, uh, and best practices, international best practices, but different offerings to make Indian as well as foreign owners to register ships under the flags of the TCG. To end, I was given five minutes, so I'm trying to be within that. To end, sharing a few thoughts, the nationality of the ships registered under the Indian International Shipping Registers of the TCG will be Indian. The flag that the vessels will fly is that of India, irrespective of the nationality of the beneficial owner. India shall have the right to requisition the ships in line with the international practices and the applicable Indian law. The benefits given to and requirements of the registry are to be based on international standards and best practices. The key point is that in order to be a power at the world stage, we need to be better in terms of how and what we offer and not through restrictions. A dream, maybe, but I think we are. We must be moving towards that, and we are moving towards that. And with that, um, I think I just finished within five minutes. And uh, uh, Captain Pulat may be happy with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jagmi. Yes, I think everyone will be happy. We all like to see the time being kept. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Keshankar, 
Mr. Shankar, I have worked with him. I spent some office time with Mr. Shankar in the mid 90s. So I have the uh, privilege of introducing him uh, from a standpoint of uh, familiarity as well. Uh, Mr. Shankar is a veteran marine engine, marine engineer of 50 plus years, assured with Cisco, SR, Sanmar, West Asia, and he has been former president, shipping division of India Cements Limited. Mr. Shankar is on the governing council of IAPI, and Mr. Shankar's topic is tonnage concerns. Please welcome Mr. Shankar. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. The topic given to me by Suri was a disaster or a contingency faced by India. How ready are we in the maritime sector? So confining myself to the maritime sector, let me touch upon the various disasters that India have faced. If uh, Kirtan can quickly present the slides, Yeah, run them over. 20 seconds for each slide, please. The scientific research have established that society has slowly become to recognize that various calamities that have occurred over past decades that India have faced, which necessitated the study of what we need to undertake, the characteristics of each uh, disaster, the predictability and what we need to do. This has changed over time and we are still learning from this process. Next. Let me, let us look at the recent past, the cyclone top tree and the massive damages that has occurred to ONGC and the barge. Events have proved that ONGC failed to alert the five vessels which were contracted, including the barge, and SOPs were not followed. Platform safety, two was not, two was compromised. The Indian Navy captain of INS Kolkata did mention that the condition of sea was so severe, the vessel should not have been there. That means these vessels were not alerted to move away to safety. Next. The post-disaster findings of this Bombay High, though at the present moment, it is under the inquiry of DG Shipping and uh, uh, Director General of Hydrocarbon, the, the matter of fact remains that there are several flaws that have occurred, several safety procedures that have been compromised, and then dumb barge, there was no tug visible in the near vicinity to be prepared to haul out the dump barge to a safe position. So in spite of the master having presumably signaled for help on the 15th of May itself, these are all indicators that India is not ready yet to face a, uh, to face a disaster and not yet ready to have contingency measures. Next. What have all these re revealed? The factors that are coming very in the knowledge of every citizen here is that observation and monitoring of every characteristic has not happened. There is room for research to improve the knowledge of everybody, every incident, and that has not been put in place. Infrastructural consideration have not taken up. The government of India has necessarily got to invest a lot of money towards information and the furnishing of infrastructure necessary for disaster warning as well as preventive hazard indicators. Disaster prepared framework that was not there. Now let us confine ourselves to shipping. In US, they have a federal emergency agency in place and they have a manner whereby a month in the year declared as the emergency month whereby all the preventive exercises have taken up as a, as a routine. From a pharmacy, from that respect, you can say India, I mean, US is a developed country. 
Whereas India, we claim to be the pharmaceutical hub, but the recent pandemic has revealed that we are in a total mess. We were in a health crisis. There were no medicine at hand, no uh, injections on ready, readily available, and we had to bank on foreign import of urgent medical supplies and life-saving drugs, including from Kenya. India was caught off guard, but we were ready with contingency measures in quick time. And that, in that respect, we must compliment the self-health groups of the Indian youth who spring into action to overcome all this. There is a Disaster Management Act by the Government of India, which is in place. And also, it covers cyclone, flood, tsunami, drought, air and maritime disaster. But the Disaster Management Committee under a cabinet minister is centrally focused and it, was, it has got subcommittees in all the states. But the Ministry of Home Affairs announced enforcement of the Disaster Management Act to facilitate interstate transport movement during the second wave of this pandemic. But factually, no sign was ever visible to all of us of such a uh, interstate control was exercised, neither was this management uh, committee was in force, nor was any central command in existence in Delhi. Actually, one bit and twice shy, few states like uh, the Greater Mumbai Corporation and Kerala and Tamil Nadu sprung into action. The systems were put in place and the disaster management was set, set, uh, set in motion. But this cannot be as an emergent measure, there has to be a standing procedure for management of all these as a future measure. So lack of understanding, awareness against policymakers, officials down the line, apathy for coordinating efforts, reveal system out of tune with realities. Life has become valueless in India. Next. India has got a large coastline and Ministry of Shipping has an effective role because India's security as well as vulnerability along the coast is very much there. We are aware of our neighbors are China, Pakistan on one side, China on the other side. We are concerned with China's proximity to Sri Lanka and we are concerned with China's proximity to Pakistan. There is a good possibility of an embargo whereby we are threatened to access Persian Gulf so are we ready in a global emergency, in a warlike situation, whether our terminals like HPCL, IOC, and the BPCL have storage facilities to have enough products stored to last us for a month during the contingency? Are we, are we ready for it? Are we, have the ministry mobilized the Indian fleet to cater to the coastal movement of products by oil, uh, like, like diesel as well as petrol, or even container vessels for essential movement of cargo from one coast to coast. Declaration of essential port two in the west coast like Mumbai and Cochin, and two in the east coast like Chennai and Vizag as contingency port in case of an emergency, depending on the area where the emergency is, the, 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 na the national authority can identify. These are the identified ports, and the, the contingency measures are implemented in that particular port to the necessary uh, action to be taken. Next. So far, even during this pandemic, the shipping and logistics could have taken a very active part in sort of jumbos uh, in hundreds flying across, across the world to bringing in medical uh, equipments and products, uh, life-saving drugs in India. We could have moved these through containers either from the Gulf or from Singapore in double quick time in three to four days. And if you had involved shipping and logistics, even intermodal transportation would have been much better facilitated rather than all these uh, essential drugs getting stocked up in the warehouses and lying there for weeks. That could have easily been avoided. All these are due to lack of mobilization of warlike situation and teams with the central in command in Delhi and command distributed across the state to various heads so that they identify these contingency te team. 
I think there is a need for formulating a, a, a maritime contingency policy. I think the professional need to be included in such a policy whereby they can play a very active part in formulating the policy and the role of the ports, the shipping, as well as the mobilization of personnel to be actively involved, including those of logistics to be actively involved in case of an emergency. Next. Next. If you remember, sometime during the year 2011, there was a civil war in February, March, Egypt, Tunisia, and that spread to Libya. There was an urgent call from Ministry of External Affairs and Ministry of Shipping seeking help of marine professionals in Chennai to explore possibilities of deploying a passenger vessel to repatriate standard Indian citizens from Libya from Port of Benghazi to Alexandria in Egypt. In less than 48 hours, a ship was identified and in coordination with both the ministries, SCA was nominated as the manager of this vessel and our professionals sailed with this vessel, Scotia Princess, that made two trips to repatriate 2,159 stranded Indians from Libya, including 10 infants to land them in Alexandria. To cut long story short, a miracle was achieved. This is a national disaster management in true letter and spirit. This is what is called coordination. And such a coordination has to be mandated in a preventive management procedure. The, the committee has to be formed as far as shipping policy are concerned that will include these contingency measures to be documented, involvement of various sectors of the shipping sector, and so that they can all be at, put on alert by the central agency through the state department or the port department. For a developed nation, India's need for emergency preparedness is very critical. Systems need to be in place. Each sector will need to be aware of its role to play. Pertinent to note, national disaster management procedures has no role for Ministry of Shipping. We have gone through the procedures in complete. Every ministry is linked with the Ministry of Home except the Ministry of Shipping. I wonder why and how it got missed out. With the vast coastline, the role of shipping and logistics is very crucial for a national disaster management plan. The inclusion of Minister of Shipping and Transport is very, very critical. Next. There was a mention that reserve fleet. What is the reserve fleet? Yes, US had a reserve fleet of 5% of the total merchant fleet to kept in reserve. They had the port of refuge identified and these vessels are on standby mode, banked to be ready at a moment's call to respond to a global contingency movement for commercial needs. India is a sensitive area. We cannot be like US to have a reserve fleet. It is not possible in the near future. So what is the next alternative that we can think of? Next alternative is identify that what are the assets like IOC, what they need to do, what are the shifts that are required to be handled in a, in a contingency. We are in the process of selling SCI. It is a national asset and not only a national asset, it is a national carrier as well. And it would have been very useful for our contingency movement. Now you sell away an asset, a profit-making asset like this. Where did we go? We had to go into the, into the market to identify so that you identify now in your contingency plan, you, you decide what type of ship that you need. You need product tankers for coastal movement. You need road carriers for shipment of crude or your oil field is capable of producing crude that will last for a month for India's needs. Or do you need to identify the type of ship that is required, identify the owner and tell them we will give you one week's notice or 15 days notice that will be mobilized for national emergency. So these are to be identified in the contingency policy, whereby these in con feeder container lines can carry essential commodities from port to port. 
we can import essential from port like singapore to either to uh, to tikoran or to uh, uh, to chennai depending on where the comfort zone of the coastline is so that these can be again distributed at the national level through these smaller vessels and ports need to be identified for an emergency be it chennai be it tikoran be it bangalore be it goa be it mumbai chennai vaidya goparadi you need to identify four ports to be to be called as emergency port at the discretion of the, the central command and they have to be prepared at short notice to have personnel management the the equipment machinery ship all ready in hand at a moment's notice next the need for involvement of marine professional for drafting out the policy cannot be over emphasized i have already mentioned about sci according to my own opinion to suit the country's needs the essential needs of product tankers to suitable the size and draft of the vessel contain a feeder vessel to move to from port to port then harbor craft tugs utility service boat that is required for the emergency contingency port that have been identified pilot boats and service launches and uh, disaster management ports and disaster management command and control to be identified suitably in my personal opinion command and control if although it is a national disaster if it can be entrusted to the defense personnel that i think would be better handled because they have uh, the unique uh, decision making process where command and control are better handled so that these can all be stipulated in the policy if this is in this uh, line i would highly recommend involvement of the professionals in this process and i thank you all for your kind attention thank you mr shankar uh captain pulath we move into panel discussion you don't have much time you may think of merging with q and a okay thank thanks everybody uh don't worry about time uh, as it happens uh, as it happens i have provided for some spare time we are into 65 minutes now we plan 70 in fact 90 we can stretch up to uh we have a very important second session uh, but nevertheless we will try to be a little more uh, time conscious now between now and let's say 11 o'clock uh, so that questions are not ignored but before that uh, let me just touch upon the previous speakers uh, what they said before we get into real panel discussion i would request to commodore wasan to come up with what exactly the navy wants as a reserve fleet for example how many tankers how many bulk carriers how many gas tankers how many passenger vessels how many uh, landing crafts for example uh, that done let me thank uh, mr hazara for delivering the keynote address it so happened uh, that the insa president uh, mrs uh, sujatha naik uh, withdrew with very short notice so i had to uh return to hazara who had the experience and i'm very happy we got the right person he has given us the multipliers of economics on the indian fleet uh, so that's where we stand and thanks to shankar for bringing up uh, so many issues or oh, before i forget the sei cmd sailing on a tanker must be one of those uh, one for guinness book of records i suppose uh, incidentally some of you might remember that the uh, sei vmcc got hit uh, of karg uh, i don't know if it was koyali or kanjunjunga one of them did get hit it was a legal case which i remember uh, coming back to strategic reserves what shankar said uh, i don't know if it's top secret but lnt has dug a big hole underground of wizag we do have strategic reserve um, and one more to add shankar mentioned about libya uh, rescue effort our members i must say proudly captain venkat and raj gobal were physically involved with that craft uh, in helping uh, those refugees and a lot of ladies and children were there as shankar mentioned and some of the questions i have seen but that uh, kamal will handle that 
but basically we are wondering whether we will have an emergency or whether we need this but i think that has been brought up by saying we got two coast we got himalayas to the north nowhere we can run our civilization itself was landlocked till the cheras and pandyas and all went east and the western uh, civilization came so to say the western marine adventures came to the west coast and then east coast and that's long history but do we need reserve fleet 100% because embargo if we get cut off the shores get cut off the beaches get cut off we are stuck with a huge population to feed we need fertilizers we need oil we need gas we need coal we need everything that is required for peaceful living unless you want riots of course so there is no question whether we need uh, a fleet only thing it has to be earmarked how do we do it it's the next question i don't want to answer all the questions but i would like to invite uh, patnaik i suppose he is there uh, can somebody unmute his mic captain patnaik uh, is in dubai he is from the tata group and he is a very smart young man and he has developed the portfolio himself and he is chartering almost one ship a week to trade on the coast which means there is some gap there is a gap in our trade where a foreign operator so to say from dubai is serving the market so what do we do uh, is there something wrong with our system uh, as i said i don't intend to trouble anybody or question anybody but it seems from liberalization 30 years ago if you go by the statistics uh, available and the graph i was showing and what mr hazara was saying we are going downhill pretty steep pretty steep look at that curve if you want which i downloaded uh, uploaded to share uh, it shows that we are literally in the wrong business 6.3 was the worst fortunately captain pinto seven islands bought some tanker so we are up to some 7 point something that's the indian trade share in our export imports that is unpardonable whatever be the policy and if the news of liberalization is this it is terrible not because we are seamen because we are active citizen we are scared we are worried about india's security as far as energy and food is concerned that's the main talk here the good news is we have hit 100 plus as it so happens in cricket the late spectators come before the batsman gets the 100 so just about 100 uh, participating so now let me give it to uh, patnaik if he is there then we also have uh, captain raj gobal raj you can take from patnaik uh, he has got some inputs to how this reserve fleet will have to work for example if under rule b there is a currency transfer problem through new york then everything will stop even if you charter foreign ships we cannot remit higher it's a practical problem those of you in shipping would know so there are issues related with this so uh, kamal can you give it to patnaik if he's not there rajgobal then back to me captain pullard uh, good up good morning yeah. thank you thank you for a nice introduction so i'm no more a young lad now plus 50 so very much indian at heart all the doing business from dubai so i was i am not really sure what what the question was but then i think what you wanted to ask is that why we have such a huge presence on the indian coast as isl dubai i think mr hajra is there he has been on our board so he knows what we do uh, so well it is a pure pure commercial arrangement and nothing to do with uh, why we do and how we do it uh, it's just that it's a tata group company based out of dubai and we are doing a lot of coastal business but yes i mean the fact that we are doing more business is that there is a depleting indian flag fleet no doubt about it and we are mostly competing with uh, indian flag when it comes to it but but there are the fact that we are doing so much business it only uh, says that government of india is so open to foreign operators operating on indian coast and ultimately um, commerce is what what decides about the flow of goods from one point to another point so if you can match the rate and you are competitive and there are no competing vessels then then you do you do business so so that is what why we are we have so much presence and i think you also wanted to address a little bit on the problem that we face with respect to uh, clearances from dg shipping and all that yes i mean there are issues with respect to customs and dg shipping 
uh, but they are getting better, I must say, over the years. There was a time when DG shipping approval, INSA approval could take almost five working days, but it has come down to two working days, which is a very, very positive development. And uh, we still have problems with customs with respect to bunker duty calculation and things like that, settlements. Uh, so I'm sure they will smoothen out over a period of time. Uh, but yes, so these are my few, but thank you again for uh, some uh, insightful discussion, which I heard earlier. I think Mr. Hajra touched upon very important point about why we require Indian flag and Indian fleet for energy security, for sustainability, for economic development, for maritime security. But we cannot, we cannot confuse between commerce and defense. I think two different subjects, I think. Uh, and uh, as you know, also Indian, Indian seafarers, they're not really geared up. They do not know how to fight war. So to expect out of Indian seafaring community to fight war is also asking too much. So I think while the merchant fleet needs to grow up the Indian flag vessels, definitely there is a need. Also the defense has to be strengthened as well. So you have a good balance between defense and commercial ships. So that's my take on what uh, to start with. If any other questions, I'm, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thanks, uh, Sauman. Actually, like I said, we must congratulate him because I know the commercial part of it. He went there as an individual, even though it's very well supported by Tatas, but he developed that portfolio very well. We must be proud of it. But at the same time, what I'm pointing out is if somebody sitting there is chartering a ship a week, there is big demand. Why are Indian owners not investing? What is wrong with our community? What is INSA watching? I think time has come to forget 406 license. 406 license has become a headache. Ask him every week he has to get uh, before li lifting subjects on a Friday evening. It's not possible. It, I mean, it, it adds to cost. So we, the citizens, are the losers. I think there's something very clear. 406 is dead. We don't want 306 in the next bill. Okay, Raj Gobal, are you there for your inputs on that? Uh, Reserve fleet operational issues. Kamal, can you facilitate? Him? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Good morning, uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Captain Pullet. So, um, yes, I, I heard uh, your comments on uh, the various uh, presentations that uh, has happened uh, so far. Uh, while, of course, uh, uh, when we are on the subject of uh, the commercial shipping and. Uh, to uh, really continue with the trading, especially in a situation where there's an embargo. So we have seen that with Iran. And uh, while we were uh, wanting to buy oil, it was not possible to pay them uh, in dollar terms. And uh, we did try using uh, Indian rupee equivalent payments, but that was also short-lived. So we required to look at uh, options uh, and to keep our trade going. Uh, the way the uh, situation in the world is, we are splintering more and more further into various blocks and therefore there could be uh, you know, situations where uh, a few countries may try to impose sanction on the others. Uh, and that would create problems and, uh, uh, in, uh, and the trade per se will suffer. Uh, so, uh, today, uh, uh, more important than ever before, a lot of countries are looking at options of digital payment, such as uh, your cryptocurrencies. And China is already uh, well advanced in uh, bringing their own cryptocurrencies. And so is US and uh, some of the private players are into it, like PayPal and so many others. So uh, we all know about Bitcoin and uh, the other uh, existing cryptocurrencies, about 10 of them uh, largely uh, being uh, today used. So uh, we need definitely a sovereign-backed uh, cryptocurrency for India too. Because in situations like these, if the trade were to be coming to a stop because we are unable to make payment, so where do we go? Uh, so we definitely require to look at that. And in that context, in fact, the gift city in uh, Ahmedabad was basically uh, the design was to uh, have uh, that city which uh, is outside the Indian law uh, so that uh, you are able to actually be an international uh, facility which could do a lot of such transactions. 
and that was really not fully fortified though there are lots of steps taken and while we are at it uh, you know the uh, colombo uh, uh, plan of extending the port city which the chinese have already uh, uh, backed that project and uh, that's a 2 billion project where that city is going to be outside the uh, sri lankan uh, law uh, basically in order to cater to such uh, situations now it is right there at the footstep of india so what whom are they really looking at if india does not move having its own then the indian private businesses will have no other option but to go to uh, such facilities which are close by and these are the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, businesses that we are offering to our uh, uh, immediate neighbors on a platter without really uh, uh, you know trying to get anything out of it so uh, and uh, uh, earlier to uh, uh, jagmeet mentioned about a second flag which is very welcome in fact uh, our loss should be so framed that in emergencies we should be able to uh, uh, you know in a jiffy able to reflag into the uh, others other flag so that we are able to continue with the trade so if we do not have such policies in place in good times so when we have an emergency in hand we will not be able to uh, immediately uh, uh, because in a, in a country like india where there is democracy of course people will immediately go to supreme court take a stay because if the laws are not in place it is not possible to do trading everything will come to a, a, a standstill so we need to have the alternates already laid out and uh, uh, so that our trade continues and we are able to continue with the, uh, you know having the right uh, uh, backups especially in uh, uh, in times like say this pandemic for example and then there are, there are several more such uh, things that we will probably go through in the next decade or so because that is how the world is moving thank you okay thanks uh, raj we are 10 minutes left for 90 minutes uh, so i think a panel discussion is good enough my only request is Uh, can we form a trio, a team of Commodore Watson, uh, Mr. Azara, and probably Captain Vikanand or Sankar or myself? I am putting three choice of one from the three, so that we make a recommendation statement to the authorities, to the government within the next one week. Okay, let me leave that thought with you because we have uh, uh, question answers as well as a very short presentation by K N Ramesh. Uh, we want to touch upon the coastal as well as inland waterways uh, questions kamal will choose but two three questions i remember let me finish it so that we save time one is yes the merchant navy officers do get a, a short defense course uh, when we do our coc at least in india unless you are doing foreign coc and trying to sail on indian ships so we do get interaction with the navy little get brainwashed and uh, and we do carry the navy papers on indian ships uh, those who are sail know that so it's not that the merchant navy as second line of defense knows nothing about coast guard and navy uh, that's something we have to do when emergency breakdown breaks out uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, micro details to be filled in let's leave that so i suppose kain ramesh is there uh, kamal can you invite kain ramesh he is going to summarize as well so i'm closing the panel discussion as it is unless hazara or komodo wasan wants to say something sir anything from your side uh you know i mean i obviously i know the time constraint all that i would say that we must look at india in the context of countries like usa china to some extent maybe japan south korea there is no point in comparing our our country our economy to anyone else and if we look at these countries we will find that in one way or the other china of course is well known japan south korea has built up their own you know control tonnage to a large extent and usa through the jones act in any case have definitely you know a lot of control on that tonnage so we must look at these countries and see how vulnerable we are we service most of the countries in the world and second thing there was a question that why why aren't you know indian indian ship owners investing when there is so much of scope which is uh, which is corroborated by the fact that shomo can you know charter one ship per week you know the we have we have talked about this for 
ages about the so called literature it was touched here also about the when talking of the you know second registry about the so called level playing field unfortunately indian ship owners are greatly constrained both primarily by the you know fiscal as well as to some extent by the commercial regime prevailing here which makes it very very difficult for us to compete on equal grounds because as we have been saying our taxation is 9 10% whereas most of the you know fleet across the world they play they pay either nothing or 0.5% and things like that so that's all i don't want to you know uh, linger because there is no time i am aware of. Thank you, sir. Does Omro Watson want to add something? Yeah, I would like to just uh, you know make some brief comments. I totally agree with uh, Mr. Hazara on his appeal for increasing our tonnage. Now, this is obviously linked to the economy that we have, which is only about two point eight three trillion. You know, we made we were hoping that it will touch five trillion, and we are still uh, one fifth that of China. You know, China is already at fifteen and moving ahead uh, after the COVID. so unless we are in a position to add to our total comprehensive national power in terms of economy in terms of tonnage in terms of sea fares luckily the sea fares is one area where we are still okay so we will not be able to move forward so we will have to work on many levels to see that you know our uh, uh, security you know not just energy security or uh, conventional security all uh, security whole in a holistic way is managed there was one or two questions about uh, you know china so it's very clear that uh, you know geographically i brought out in my presentation to say that we are blessed with geography you know in terms of having andaman nicobar which is 714 nautical miles from chennai and we have lakshadweep minikal which is you know southwest of india so we need to cultivate this and ensure that there is the dependence for our warships our coast guard ships in terms of being supported is brought down to the minimum well, here is where the figures that i quoted are authentic so the strategic petroleum reserve we are talking about apparently something which is giving you a 87 day oil blink with the united nations security council which will intervene to stop any war within first 10 15 days the indian army has developed cold war doctrine so but we could not back on this another important point that came out was on digital payments you know if you do not have the capacity to transact how will you appear the people which is where the importance of developing your own ability to fight war on your own becomes extremely important i thought i'll flag some of these issues because these are important but don't worry too much about china in terms of how it's come to sri lanka you know somebody specifically quoted 290 kilometers from kanyakumari if it is 290 kilometers from kanyakumari it's within the fighting range of the navy the army the air force so don't worry about it we'll neutralize them should it come to that so don't worry about it too much but yes we should be on guard and ensure that uh, you know his weaknesses are addressed his major weakness is pa passing through the straits of malacca we can neutralize him there that's where we should be you know concentrating in all our efforts in showing up our capability in andaman nicobar so you saw that there's a big photograph that was there day before yesterday of ana chakra returning to ladivostok through the straits of malacca so every vessel that goes through straits of malacca will be monitored so if you know who's coming in who's going out of course there are issues of uh, how are you going to manage differently flagged ship so which is why the maritime domain awareness program that is being controlled from navy from gurgaon has a major role in you know separating the shaft from the grain so we need to invest on not only separating the shaft from the grain but then what to do with the shaft so there are many questions i know uh, we do not want to run into the times of others but these are some important issues that must be followed up but thank you i think uh, some wonderful points have been made by all the panelists and also external speakers uh, you know who have showed us what our vulnerabilities are there and therefore how we need to address them so the challenge for this panel and for others is to come out with the way ahead options on how we need to address them and be more capable of taking on a future contingency thank you okay thank you sir so we must form a team as i said ideally uh, mr hajara uh, Omro Watson and one from us, probably uh, Captain Vivekanand. Okay, uh, I suppose uh, Ken Ramesh is there. Ramesh, please. Yeah, very much here. And uh, Commodore Watson, on a very uh, lighter note. Correct. India is blessed with a beautiful geography, but we are cursed with our capricious decision making by the men who matter out there. Unfortunately, that's the reality. 
now let me get into the uh, let me get into the uh, coastal shipping well i've uh, in the last 5 years i've moved 2 million tons per annum of coal on the coast and i can tell you the amount of pains that i've gone through with the administration in chartering the vessels has been even more than a labor pain it's been it's it's tremendous i mean to to handle 2 million tons on the coast per annum which is almost like two vessels a week uh, and dealing with the kind of uh, you know sanctimonious uh, rules and regulation outdated rules and regulations that we have has been quite a challenge and i'd like to highlight it without taking too much of time i'll, I'll just spend 5 minutes on this and uh, then wrap up and summarize what uh, the previous speaker spoke well uh, you know to to have a good coastal shipping uh, running fueling the system of indian economy we need to have a great deal of improvements on our fiscal regime especially let's start with the duty on bunkers now at the end of the day the end user is going to pay for whatever we move and he needs a cost effective solution now if he needs a cost effective solution the start point would be the price of bunker prices for uh, for vessels to run on the coast second we have to have a comprehensive coastal shipping policy we are all over the place i mean uh, uh, the feeder vessels have a different set of rules bulk carriers have a different set of rules the tankers are in their own league i mean everybody is in different directions it's a cosmic chaos uh, unfortunately you know uh, i mean these these things uh, they they have to be looked at a very large perspective from from a very uh, large perspective and a uniform policy has to be brought about which is the need of the r immediately now india has got uh, you know uh, about over 1 lakh uh, miles of uh, uh, land uh, roadways of which only 1.7% is highways so the only way you can move commodities is to ease the road traffic ease the traffic on the highways is to move commodities on the coast and especially like what kamado wasan said when we are blessed with such a beautiful geography i think we are falling short somewhere on that you know i mean we recently i mean in the recent past we we were the first ones to start a, a line up roro shipping trade across the uh, across the indian peninsula we would move a uh, cars from the east coast to west coast and bring back cars from the west coast to east coast i mean we ran it for 7 months and uh, i'll just finish off with this little uh, little example of what we had to face and uh, that would tell a larger story now when we started this roro business there was a policy in the ministry of shipping which said that they would uh, they would pay 3000 rupees for every car that is lifted off the road and moved by ship it was published in the uh, ministry of shipping uh, you know policy uh, in the website and uh, we started this road service thinking that uh, you know this is something that's going to be handed over to us and uh, we moved substantial amount of cars from the east coast the the fords of the world the hyundai's the renault nissans and brought back from the other side uh, tatas and you know uh, hyundai's got another uh, car manufacturing unit on the west coast and uh, <coughs> sorry we brought back uh, now when we moved these cars from east coast a simple thing like customs has no business in coastal shipping customs wanted initially uh, wanted us to file an domestic export general manifest now what that is i don't know if someone could explain to me later i'd be very grateful uh later we we explained to them and they saw sense and they said okay it's probably not required but we used to file a shipping bill on the other side when we went to west coast the kandla customs used to insist on a coastal shipping bill and a coastal uh, export general manifest for cars that are being exported from there we are not exporting any cars we are just moving the cars around the around the uh, peninsula but unfortunately you know these are the kind of uh, these are the kind of policies that we are faced with on the east coast you the same customs same rules and regulations all over india but interpreted differently in different places now how does a coastal shipping carrier deal with all of this needless to say the kind of problems that you go through with the dg in getting your okay it's improved like uh, captain patnaik said it's improved uh, now to get a uh, to get an approval it takes about two days but 
you know it it should be a lot shorter in this digital world in this uh, new age where everything is done on a jiffy with a press of a button it should be almost in- instantaneous well uh, that's a discussion for another time but these are the kind of issues that we are faced with you know and at the end of it when we when we ran this coastal sh- uh, coastal roro business the shipping ministry raised their arms and they said we placed this in front of the ministry uh, the uh, finance ministry and finance ministry refused to give any dole outs so the 3000 rupees was lost and as a result we did the entire shipping of cars from east to west and west to east coast uh, introducing a new aid service uh, a very new aid service on the roro shipping i mean fruit I, it was it was rendered fruitless i mean it it just went down the drain there was i mean uh, we couldn't create a legacy there and uh, i'm not too sure if roro shipping can ever happen on the coast going forward well this is a little snippet i wanted to say of what happens on the indian coast well i mean uh, if uh, captain pullet if it's all right can i summarize all the speakers otherwise we could go on and on with what's I, I, happening in the indian coastal shipping i think uh, we missed the summary or i think most of us have heard they're going to make a physical report and circulate it uh, kamal spin will do that hard copy we are already 90 minutes so let's keep okay okay fine okay come back to questions are not too many and uh, we can't the question answer also or club it in the end because the next session is very important come on i leave it to you yes uh, thank you uh, uh, fortunately uh, most of the questions have got answered in this uh, discussion we had now so uh, there's only one question i think will require uh, jagdeep to answer this one please Uh, Jagmeet, uh, this is a question for you from uh, Captain Ajay Ajitan. Uh, what he wants to know is that uh, in the case of the second register that you are proposing, um, how will we ensure that political and bureaucratic interference will not make the alternative to the red ensign redundant? Second, we'll just say uh, not start it, or we we'll lose quality control. Jagmeet. yours well that's a big story actually let's get over the bureaucratic problems like we said about customs and uh, uh, subsidy for example in fact there is subsidy to shipyards if you want to know uh, but that has never been paid so two of my friends running shipyards are uh, up in arms or they put the arms down and surrendered also in other words they closed the yard so it's not get to deep into those issues uh, that comes once these things get established so for want of time let's switch to the next topic uh, if others don't mind you can always ask me personally questions or uh, mail it to me we will answer in writing if necessary just to save time thank you very much so we are switching to the next topic today is world environment day in case you forgot and somebody talked about a practice drill about uh, preparation for emergency response i think there is nothing to beat it but before the monsoon monsoon hit kerala coast south yesterday so i think we'll bring in donny and uh, kapil gupta if they want to have a practice session this is the time before monsoon really hits bombay uh, before june 7th uh, the normal date so let me start the second session properly uh, i hope some may have joined additionally or some may want to leave but we are still very close to 100 thank you for, for everyone for listening to us the second topic is more important because when a disaster happens if you are not ready there is no recording in progress picking up the whistle and blowing and we have administrative problems as well um, it must be streamlined there must be a single authority we are trying to recommend that through national shipping board mrs malini shankar will uh, chair the moderator session uh, panel discussion towards the end I-, i hope she has joined so we in mec came up with a word called imera if nothing else it stands for indian maritime emergency response authority the last word obviously comes from bureaucratic language uh, authority so we need something like that like we have source rep in uk one person not a committee who can drive and it should be synchronized with national disaster management plan we cannot be playing tug of war 
we must have powers properly distributed resources manpower funds everything because this country if your national highway gets blocked waterways get blocked with a earthquake or something you can you can only approach from the coast so the navy and coast guard is important the air force is important for dropping food and medicines and airlifting and things like that so we must work closely with national disaster management plan unfortunately we don't have time to involve them here so we are sticking with navy and coast guard uh, so i have to hand over after that to venkat venkat if you are ready let's get on with it Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Kirtan, just uh, just show one that that only one slide I have sent you. Seaward emergency and pollution control response. The video can switch to Venkat, please. Shall I stop mine? Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, I myself have uh, shared it here. Uh, Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are a republic and a democratic society, and we are governed our day-to-day -day life by set of laws which we have given it unto ourselves. So there is a law linking every activity that takes place in our uh, sphere of activities. So the government is duty bound to adhere to the laws. Created by the parliament, that is the lawmakers. So, to prevent any emergency or pollution uh, onto our country, we have a national disaster management setup, which consists of various ministries except shipping. It is unfortunate that they have not thought about it or considered that some kind of a mishap or some kind of a pollution related uh, cause can come from the seaward side onto the land the merchant shipping act mostly licenses all the assets that operate in the offshore industry our offshore industry activity started from the year 1962 gradually developing from 70 onwards we have a lot of uh, rules and regulations uh, coming into place but everything was a standalone independent uh, operating rules. When ONGC has some uh, emergency control measures that is with respect to a particular unit and uh, they, they are not thinking about the pollution or a blowout can reach the uh, shores of India, like it can go to Gujarat or it can come to you know, Maharashtra and all along the coast or on the east coast, it can come to Andhra Pradesh and go anywhere, you know, including Andaman, Nicobar, it can uh, travel. There is, there is no plan on the on the on the boards of law you know there is nothing connecting these kind of incidents to the national disaster management plan even in the 2019 they have omitted anything coming from the seaward side and uh, the ministry of shipping which is controlled most of the assets there by way of licensing inspection monitoring is totally not there in the picture but these plans have been going on since 2016 I do not know why uh, people have not uh, looked at it and uh, did not want to get the Ministry of Shipping uh, involved and uh, you know uh, be in the advisory level or at least in the you know uh, guidance level they could have been involved in that. So there is no there is no plan and the NDMA does not have any plan for any kind of uh, emergency out at uh, sea like what happened uh, you know a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, in uh, in one of those uh, you know uh, production uh, platforms while construction. There is no plan at all in the NDMA schemes. And also the ONGC also did not have any plan. And if you see a uh, disaster management plan, what we see in the public domain of uh, Coast Guard, it's only about how to control oil spills. And whether they have, uh, whether they have uh, you know, uh, uh, procedures, how to do it is there. Maybe they may have a document which is not available for us in the public domain to analyze and see to or offer comments or offer some extra advice. It is not there. So we need somebody who has got uh, a overall uh, overall picture or a overall uh, authority with responsibility to tackle all the ministries together in case of an emergency that were to happen in the offshore fields of India, either on the east coast or on the west coast. 
this uh, particular person, uh, you should not have only a paper authority like DG shipping. DG shipping can give only issue orders because it has to be executed by either by another ship owner or by some other authority. If you, if you see the DG shipping has got powers to invoke uh, in kind of emergencies as per the Merchant Shipping Act 356L or 411, but it has to be passed on to somebody. So the, the offshore emergency coordinator must be best with the uh, Navy and the Coast Guard who have their asset and they have got manpower standing 24 by 7 and they are the ones who went for the rescue of these people of P305. So uh, an on-scene commander should be with these people who are trained to perform such kind of jobs in a very tiring and difficult situations and are also volunteering to do this because these people are the front line of defense. They will not hesitate to go and save anybody or protect any assets. So they must be equipped with um, a proper uh, kind of vessels and equipments and further training how to contain this kind of a situation like a blowout, like it happened in the deep water horizon. It, it can happen in our coast also. We should be prepared for all these things. So with this, uh, we will uh, in invite uh, the Coast Guard uh, Commandant. He is a serving officer. He has had uh, hands-on experience. He has attended. Uh, international arbitrations. He's a 1990 batch Indian Coast Guard officer specialized in navigation and direction from the Indian Navy. And he's also a specialist in search and rescue courses from Singapore and IMO level three oil response for YSRL, having diploma in uh, masters in maritime affairs from World Maritime University. He's also an LLB from Delhi University. He has commanded four classes of Indian Coast Guard ships and responded to two oil spills and two major firefighting operations at sea and coordinated more than 12 oil spills, vast experience in operational matters. I invite IG Doni Michael to uh, open the session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'll try to share my screen. It's not going that much. So can someone share the, my slides, please? Yeah, I will, I will share. So the slides come on. Uh, the session, session is on focusing on Indian Maritime Emergency, Emergency Response Authority. It's a good acronym. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Coast Guard in my personal capacity. Uh, I'm not representing the views of the Indian Coast Guard. Uh, in best, I can say I'm representing Indian Coast Guard as amicus curiae. That is it. I mean, what is this uh, association is uh, been known for? Right, we are, the first slide. Okay, we have been witnessing the container uh, ships fires in the last, particularly last 15 years. I, IG, IG, Donny, your, your mic is off. You tell me which slide you want. Second, third. Yeah, can I go? Yes. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, uh, just go to the previous slide, uh, the first slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, just uh, a brief introduction on the container ship problems. Uh, mostly it's on, uh, you know, the fire problems arose um, um, in the past 15 years. And the Indian Coast Guard has responded more than 15 uh, ship fires uh, by firefighting through the Coast Guard ships. It's actually not meant to uh, fight you know, uh, fire professionally, unlike the DP ships do, but uh, the capability we have, uh, which is also limited, we're trying our best to fight the fire, at least as an emergency response. The next slide. Uh, these are the pictures of the, you know, recently uh, undertaken firefighting operations. Uh, the top right is the Polar Express. The bottom left is the, you know, the famous uh, empty star diamond. Uh, and the right also is the empty star diamond. You can see that uh, the ship 201 is a famous Samudra Prairie. This is a pollution control vessel 
which is capable of fighting fire. Uh, you know, it has a limited DP capability. So it has a, a little bit uh, 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 a capability to fight the fire, uh, not unlike the other professional um, OSVs. Next slide, please. On the left top most corner, again, the pollution control vessel is fighting the fire. The name of the ship is MV Amsterdam Bridge. This ship was, uh, you know, a living. I want to add some stories so that you know it, it, it will have the attention of everybody. It was in the year 2012, in August or September, uh, and the ship was leaving Mumbai port. And it was um, a Singapore ship uh, flagged in Panama. And it had an explosion while it was leaving the Mumbai harbor. It had pilot on board. The pilot disembarked immediately and directed uh, the ship to go and anchor and you know evacuate the personnel. Because the explosion was so great, it was heard even up, uh, up to 10 kilometers from uh, the port premises. I was inside the harbor. We sailed immediately. That time, I had no experience. I was commanding the ship, 201. I had no experience. I can go you know, very close and fight the fire. It took a while you know, to um, get close to it. And we remained there for more than 72 hours. And we, was, uh, you know, we were able to bring down the fire. Now, I want to add additional uh, information. You know, it's not, you know, only the fire which is a problem here. You know, after the fighting fire, you know, the ship was anchored just on the channel. The channel was about 12 meters, and the ship has a draft of 10 meters. Post fighting the fire, the ship had a draft, big, and the draft increased to 11.5 meters. Now, what will happen? You know, after it was estimated. After three or four days, the tide in Mumbai is going to be minus 1.5 meters. That means at a particular point of time with the same draft, if it's not reduced by pumping out, it's going to get ground. And this vessel had almost 900 tons of heavy fuel oil. That will be a bigger headache than you know what has happened right now. So we uh, told uh, the port to you know, take charge of it. The port said, okay, Coast Guard, uh, you know, the salvers have come. Uh, you just coordinate with uh, the salvers. The salvers, after embarking, embarking the ship, they found almost all the tanks were full. The holes were full. They, took, uh, they asked for per specific permission from the Coast Guard to pump out the uh, water. I was amazed. Just, I said, just pump out. You know, they were very particular. No, please give us in writing. You know, uh, otherwise we are not going to do anything. And you know, it was a catch 22 situation. If I give the you know, approval, and um, you know, there may be consequences later. But if I don't do, within two days, you know, the ship will get aground. Then later, I communicated with my headquarters and found out uh, you know, the salvers were very specific in asking because the water is already contaminated. When they pump out this water outside the ship, they need specific permission from environmental authority. Now, since it, within the port premises, within the territorial waters, the land acts apply. And accordingly, the environment department of the Maharashtra government, they came inside. They said, you know, you can't pump out the water. It has to be pumped out with some barges and thereafter it should be, you know, treated and then only they'll do the permission. A lot of challenges were there. We coordinated, we had a, uh, our ship had some capacity to take in some water. And we you know we coordinated very well. Later, a ship's company also was involved because it had an explosion. The explosive department of the government of Maharashtra was also got involved. The sections of IPC also was put on the ship. The captain was a Ukrainian. You know, first, he used to be aggressive against the Coast Guard. What all actions we had taken because we forced him to you know to, uh, to act on, on on the directions given by the Coast Guard. Later. That ship remained there for more than four months because there were certain sections, uh, Explosive Act, the Environment Act, the Water Act, and so many other acts were put against the ship and took a while for the ship to get out of Mumbai. This I'm saying because everybody will say uh, it's very easy to just go and fight the fire and come out, but there are a lot of other issues also involved in firefighting. On the right, again, we are fighting the fire which is uh, uh, a small comfort in the year 2013. 
the middle of arabian sea the pre previous slide only sir yes the right side top corner uh, again i am i am finding the fire even though there were four or five ships you know which is stand by to fight the fire they didn't go in um, particularly because of the reason uh, you know it was carrying a lot of dangerous cargo but you know we are all trained in, in a particular way you know we bash on regardless you know then anything happens we'll take care of it later and the other uh, the same ship when when approached from astern you know it was under tow and i'm aware you know after this uh, incident we were able to rescue a person who just snapped his hand uh, and and uh, we were we were able to bring him back uh, safely to the port in the rough sea conditions which occurred in july 2013 next slide please next slide next slides oh having uh, you know looked into the issues of the firefighting now another incident and a type of incidents which coast guard responds is the oil spill there was some debate earlier uh, and also uh, captain venkat also touched upon uh, whether we have a system in place to respond to oil spills in india the indian coast guard is recent so it's just finished 44 in service before that the oil spill issues were looked after by the dg shipping as a central coordinating authority in the 19 the year 1986 the authority in the central coordinating authority was passed on to indian coast guard and in 1992 we had a committee of secretaries approving a draft national oil spill contingency plan disaster contingency plan and the first edition was promulgated in 1996 there afterwards uh, it had an updated version the latest edition being the 2015 if you look into this book you know we come to understand you know not a single organization is fully equipped to you know tackle uh, this kind of incidents so the government of india rightly so always you know uh, tries to tackle all these emergencies through a committee uh, of you know involving various ministries and organizations accordingly the nasty If you ever happen to open to it, it has uh, you know a support system of 27 different agencies, including the major player being the Indian Navy and the DG Shipping, which you know, we can call for additional ships under 356L. It had it was invoked in several cases, and also the powers were given to Indian Coast Guard under 356J, G, and K for giving notice to the polluter, and thereafter, if he fails to do any action. we will you know respond to that uh, oil spill and thereafter we'll seek a claim from the polluter these are uh, some of the pictures you know way back in 2005 to 2015 the recently we didn't have major oil spills except for uh, don kanchipuram uh, of chennai uh, that was in the year 2016 and 17 and thereafter the whatever the oil spills that has occurred are all minor in nature it's less than 10 or 15 tons which are which occurs outside the coast um, you know we generally tackle by application of oil spill dispersants if it comes near the coast we have some uh, next slide please uh, we have some you know uh, national pollution response capability which involves um, you know more than 20 kilometers of boom we have ships and aircraft equipped with uh, locating the oil spills even during night and we have skimmers we have applicators we have you know oil barges which can roughly i can say it can tackle up to a spill of uh, say 2000 to 5000 tons at sea and you know under this north cp as i said earlier it has to be tackled through a coordination of efforts from uh, uh, from all the different agencies so what we did um you know i mean uh, red the convention which you know applies for the oil spills that is the oprc oil preparedness response and cooperation 1990 imo convention uh, where which the india is party we found you know the first major roadblock is uh, as per the convention we have to nominate as a one singular agency as a central uh, the competent national authority so far it has not been 
established under any legislation. However, through a, a governmental committee, this is what I call a soft law track. India, I mean, Indian Coast Guard has been provided various soft law uh, kind of uh, powers, but we're not hard law through any legislation. So we actually coordinate, um, you know, oil spill response capability of the ports, of the major ports and the minor ports. We go for inspection. We keep telling them to you know, at least equip themselves to have um, uh, oil spill response equipments to fight uh, up to a tier one spill that is up to 700 tons. And most of the major ports have acquired it, but not up to the level of 700 tons, but at least to respond to immediate uh, you know, oil spills that occur in that jurisdiction. Um, an interesting development has taken place um, last year. The ports have come together. They understood, you know, pool, um, um, you know, stockpiling of equipment uh, for unknown oil spill is, you know, it's a drain the resource and also earmark um, port personnel for that. So they have formed a committee to identify a suitable uh, oil response service provider. So that they, they identified in six places, there'll be, this service provider will be uh, having a stockpile to respond to more than 10,000 tons to any ports under duress, and for which they'll be paid remuneration by collecting fee from the visiting ships or through other arrangements. Through this, the ports will look after uh, all these oil spill uh, disasters within the port limits, and the Coast Guard is always there because None of the oil spill which occurred in port area remains within that area. It uh, travels into the sea and to the shore areas. And under the NOS uh, GCP, which also has a subdivision of regional oil spill disaster contingency plan and the district oil spill disaster, uh, disaster contingency plan, through which uh, you know arrangements have been identified even up to the local district level, wherein we can pull in resources um, uh, from the various stakeholders and tackle the spill. Remember, you know, what our services is doing is not free because um, always there is an insurer, there's a P&I club. Well, most of the cases are stepped in and assisted in, you know, in um, making the reimbursements and also, you know, bringing a lot of other response equipment and resources from outside to tackle any oil spills. But I must admit, but we don't have you know, a person in authority to tackle oil spills, you know, under any legislation. So we always depend upon, you know, the support system. Now, Coast Guard, having understood, um, you know, the, uh, this high risk activity that is play taking place, we have in our uh, inventory, next slide. A specialized uh, Samadra Prairie class uh, oil uh, pollution control vessel. We have right now three in numbers. One is already, you know, standby at Colombo to respond to oil spills that may emanate from uh, sinking of uh, MV Pearl Express. Uh, two are there standby at one in West Coast and one in East Coast. So uh, this uh, is as limited capacity can respond to various type of oils. And uh, you can also, you know, separate the oil and then thereafter they can take the collected oil to transport it to another refinery or sometime later. And next, bill, uh, next slide, please. To your, for your information, uh, we are also, uh, you know, um, placed order for two additional pollution control, which is most advanced. It's a next generation pollution control vessel. It's an inbuilt uh, faster and cleaner and smarter recovery system where you don't have to have a side sweeping arms. Uh, uh, it will comes automatically and it can actually, you know, respond to more than 1000 tons in a day. Uh, this is what we are looking forward and it uh, might take two to three years to come into commissioning. Now, I'll come to the issues in hand. Next slide, please. So uh, the key points in the marine disaster management are, first we have to understand what are the vulnerabilities and the challenges. You know, the cyclone doesn't come. You know, during around these months, if we take that, um, you know, the past histories, 
in the west coast around two to three cyclones on the east coast three to four cyclones occur we have to be ready to face those challenges we know our coast apart from the cyclone we have the monsoons you know hitting from june to september in the west coast and from november to january in the east coast for which you know the ships and the coast guard ships and the naval ships we have a monsoon plan and we sail ships accordingly so i think um, you know the um, the vessels which are involved in especially in offshore activities that we have to have a you know monsoon plans or cyclone avoidance plans or some contingency plans and i want to mention here just like nost gcp um, i think uh, admiral kapil gupta sir will touch upon it um, navy has a robust plan established with ongc to you know foresee what all uh, kind of emergency that might uh, arise from the offshore development area platforms and to tackle those and and i my my salute goes to them because they tackled very nicely as per the plan during the passage of the cyclone talk day and they have done a wonderful job because uh, <coughs> and we also joined them to rescue more than 120 survivors now coming to the legislation and regulations of enforcement we have um, firstly the merchant shipping act which actually gives for maritime safety maritime security and environment protection for the maritime safety and environment protection for the ships we undertake through flag state um, implementation program and also for the foreign ships through port state controls unfortunately coast guard is not involved in any inspections of the foreign vessels or the indian vessels also regarding the uh, you know the risks involved in oil spill uh, for under the port state control system so we are only come we come into the picture only when the oil spills that to the oil reaches the water then only we are activated as per the act you also have to understand you know there are a lot of fishing boats uh, fishing uh, Hey, IG Donny, uh, just uh, lost connection. Able to hear you, IG Donny. We are not able to hear you. I think he is disconnected. So. Maybe you come back again. Okay. Uh, with this, we will uh, move on. We will ask him to complete it uh, later on because he has got only one uh, last slide. A thank you slide is left out. So when he comes back, uh, we'll talk again. I I will uh, request a. Uh, our uh, vice president uh, captain suresh uh, amirabhu he is uh, he is from the uh, last batch of uh, dufrin and he is associated with uh, very many port related direct activities uh, he is uh, an expert in the port management uh, sector i request uh, suresh amirabhu to take over uh, thank you venkat and uh, as you rightly mentioned i am also involved in msc so i think Uh, the very first thing that i would like to do and this is very spontaneous is to thank um the excellent panel as well as all the participants for joining in here um, we have been close to uh, 100 uh, participants it's, it's, it's this is very heartwarming to see this kind of response and uh, also to the participants uh, to the speakers themselves um i am going to uh, of course as an organizer i also have to stick to time so let me keep this very short Uh, i am going to talk on an issue which is of uh, unfortunately which time and time again hits us in our face which is the dangerous carriage of dangerous cargo cargoes by sea um the the whole question of uh, dangerous cargoes uh, stems from the fact that that international commerce requires these cargoes to be carried from one place to the other and they are carried by sea uh, of course some of it uh, carried by air rarely Uh, but mostly uh, by sea and therefore over a period of time there has been the uh, uh, imdg the international maritime dangerous goods code which has been developed uh, 
Um, broadly, as a, most of us know, these are classified into various uh, nine classifications. Um, and the key word, in my opinion, is this nine letter word called dangerous, because that's what they are. They are very dangerous, and they range from the range of danger changes, the explosives, the gases compressed, liquefied, or dissolved under pressure, flammable liquids, flammable solid, oxidizing substances, toxics and infectious substances, radioactive substances, corrosives. And if all this is not enough, there is a mis miscellaneous category as well. Now, I think when we look at uh, carriage of these dangerous goods by sea, uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, and, and mind you, the different modes of carrying even within by sea. So I think the question we have to ask ourselves is uh, threefold. Is the regulatory regime adequate and is it up to date? Is the documentary regime adequate and is it up to date? And documentary in this case, not merely checklists, but also the record keeping. And finally, these SOPs which are in place, are they actually carried out? You know? And eventually, are there independent auditors who are auditing this, both in form of a scheduled exercise, uh, as well as in the form of a random and surprise checks? Now, uh, due to limitation of time, let me focus on the fact that uh, in terms of the different types of cargoes uh, which are carried by sea, <clears throat> bulk gases and uh, bulk liquids, you know, both uh, hydrocarbons uh, such as natural gas, LNG, LPG, um, as well as uh, the whole range of uh, petroleum products, both crude uh, as well as the whole range of products and uh, bulk chemicals being carried by sea. Uh, here, the situation is, is, I mean, the dangers are no less. Uh, but the response to the danger, the adherence of the IMDG code is probably relatively a little better uh, because the number of players are less in number. Industry has taken a great deal of effort and you have to you see, you know, uh, industry related codes and regimes in place such as ISGOT or OICMS and so on and so forth, which, um, which have understand, which understand clearly the dangers and they're fairly a professional approach towards um, handling these um, to a lesser extent, but equally less, uh, no less laudable is the efforts of uh, dry bulk cargo as well. And uh, there is a code for that as well, and which is to a large extent adhere, adhere. Most of the problems really come from uh, the container mode. And it's not at all surprising that uh, uh, IG Donnie's very first slide talked about container disasters. Now, uh, there is a reason for this. See, containerization itself is the one fundamental change or one fundamental difference in containerized mode as opposed to all the other modes that I mentioned, that in container mode, the unit that carries the cargo has changed. This is no longer the ship. The unit that carries the cargo is the container. Second thing is the intermodability of the container. The standard marine ISO container is, is, uh, is, it, is, it is adhered clearly to some standards, which makes it universal it's possible to use the first and foremost it is possible to carry this by different modes road rail and barge sea and within sea by various different ships along this route the second thing is because uh, it's also the most democratic part of shipping because the maximum number of people are involved in this and then there is multi layers because there there are lcls there are nvocc's so it's not that there are, you know a few standard carriers or a few, or limited number of carriers as you have in the other modes and very often, because of its sheer intermodability, the actual place where the stuffing of the container takes place could be, could be and is very often some inland dry port. Nobody knows how it is stuffed, whether the packing and lashing and shoring are adequate for the sea passage. A whole host of the people up and down this chain do not know what forces this container is subjected to when it is in a sea bay. To my mind, this is the fundamental problem where why we have so much of these issues in, in terms of container shipping. The other point also, which um, I, and I personally, from my own experience, both as a port operator and, and as a seafarer who's, who has uh, worked on container ships, is that I think the, uh, the, the design in terms of modern ships now, and these are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the biggest ship is now almost 24,000 TEU capacity. Uh, the conventional method of fighting fires simply does not work. I think this idea of just flooding a hole with CO2, as we were taught 
to do is no longer viable for the simple reason that, in my opinion at least, that each of these containers is a unit. It's a box by itself and it's a sealed box. So it's not going to be easy for the CO2 to find its way in. And that is making these extremely vulnerable for a whole host of reasons. And then, of course, uh, the, the impact of weather. And each passing year, we are seeing more and more accidents. We're seeing more and more containers being lost overboard uh, due to heavy weather, which again begs the question as to whether uh, the lashing of these containers is adequate for the seaway that there is in. And all these have a cumulative effect on IMDG cargo that they're carried. And last but not least, because this, this once a container is stuffed in the shipper's location somewhere inland, it could then make a road journey, then a rail journey, then come to the port, then it could be loaded on first the container, the feeder ship, then it goes to a hub port, then it goes along the trunk route on a mainline vessel, and then it gets discharged at the, uh, the, the, at the region where it's supposed to, then it goes into another feeder ship, and then it finally reaches a discharge port where it's offloaded, and all too often, it again goes, makes another journey, either by barge or by road or by rail, until it reaches the warehouse of the importer where it is finally de-stuffed. So it's not touched or handled from the time it's stuffed in the shipper's warehouse until it reaches the destination country to the warehouse of the, uh, of the importer. So what then happens is that this is a, a chain with various links. And again and again, we have found out that it is the weakest link in the chain that... Uh, that, that causes all the problems here. And th it's also a chain which is subjected to so many forces because when, the when this container is on the ship, we all know what kind of forces it is subjected to in the middle of a seaway, more so when there is uh, 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 you know, heavy storm or heavy weather. Uh, and of course, today, we cannot, talk, uh, cannot but talk about containerized dangerous goggles without talking about the recent Express Pearl case. Now, you see the impact of IMDG here. The cargo in question was nitric acid. And if you just look at the IMDG code, it tells us that this is class eight. It's a corrosive liquid. It's not combustible, but it's a strong oxidizer that enhances the combustion of the substances. So theoretically, when we looked at this cargo, we would think that the danger to this actually comes from the fact that it's corrosive and it's a reactive liquid. But see what it has done. Okay, from this one single box, we've had, has caused, or I don't know, number of boxes, I guess, which, which carried this uh, nitric acid. These boxes collectively have caused one. Number one, of course, there was leakage in which the reactive liquid came up. Number two, there was fire. Number three, there was explosion. Number four was a complete loss to life. Then, the sh then when once the firefighters gave, came on board, then the ship flood got flooded. The only silver lining I see in this whole episode is the fact that all the crew were evacuated from the ship without loss of life. And then see where it goes up. The ship we abandoned. It's now grounded. It's becoming a major environmental hazard. And there is danger that the debris could reach all the way up to the ecologically sensitive coral banks in the Gulf of Manda. So things can go very wrong and very fast. And here we have to ask ourselves, where do we stand in India on this? Now, here, and if you come back to the, to, the, to the kind of little checklist that I had, what is the regulatory regime? IMDG code is under the MS Act. Okay, now the MS Act, and rather the IMDG code does specify that there will be punishment of um, violation for those who do not fulfill this. But the fact of the matter is that the actual packing is supposed to be done to the packing of the Indian Institute of Packing. But the fact is that in the actual locations where these are stopped, so which will be somewhere inland, people have really no clue. And nor do any local authorities get involved. I don't think the district magistrate really has any clue as to what the MS Act says. To be, uh, I don't mean to disres disrespect everybody, but that I think that is the reality. I don't think the police also have any idea what the MS Act is. And if you start from there and keep going all the way down, the sheer capability of destruction is very hard. And therefore, I think this is something that we need to address and we need to address it very quickly. Then of course, unfortunately or fortunately, there is the Indian question of Jugad. The word Jugad is mentioned earlier. To me, Jugad is a big range. I don't think it's, it stops at one place. And Jugad in India can range right from Nayapan, which is innovative and fresh ideas, which is always- Collect, like collect, collect. But all the way to Chalta hai. Chalta hair is where is the what is the bare minimum need to I need to do and how can I get away with it? 
So unless we address that these are the real problems that, that we are confronted with, I think we, will, we can have a serious problem, the issue on our hands. Now, uh, as far as this particular thing, Express Pearl is concerned, the only reference really to, be, to India is to be the fact that um, the line claims, the shipping line involved claims that uh, they had uh, requested this box to be offloaded one of the Indian ports and that port refused. But otherwise, uh, there's been a lot of information flowing around. But yesterday, actually, I got a um, I, I, I got a call from someone who's actually seen the manifest, and he confirms to me that the cargo was actually loaded in Jabal Ali, and it was meant for Jakarta. And these are all intermediate ports that we are coming in. But nonetheless, it is the wise who learn from the mistakes of others, and therefore, I think that this should be a wake-up call for us in the manner that we are doing these things, and uh, before any other major disaster hits us. Um, I, I was listening very carefully to Commodore Donny because uh, here is a gentleman who's actually seen it, who's been there, who's done it, who's actually handled disasters. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, uh, I don't think we can work with this system, honestly, where you have, a, you know, multiple 27 agencies involved in looking at a disaster. And then once the rectification action has, has to happen, then you have to take permission from one party as to whether the uh, you know, water uh, accumulated water of the for, for firefighting can be pumped out or not. Then you have to take, you know, from some other uh, department. This simply will not work. And then the third guy, you're coming and saying whether the Water Act is being violated or not. I don't think that this is the way that we can we can uh, we can operate on this. This is a huge wake up call. I think we need to do something. We need to do something very quickly, and we need to do the correct thing. And in this connection, I think right in front of us is staring the fact that we have to have. Um, a source rep or an equivalent of source rep here in, in India, and we in MSC call it IMERA, but they just that is just a name. More important thing is that there has to be an authority who has to be trained, he has to be conscious, he has to have the domain knowledge, and then and only then he and all these guys have to come under them. The, the, there's a real little fear that I think from what I see, there's a little fear that people think uh, they have to protect their own turf, and you know who's this guy coming to come all over the out of the blue and tell us what to do and how to do. Uh, I think that that is that needs to be addressed. Um, you know these fears. I find really that 90% of the uh, objections which people have stem from ignorance rather than from uh, from uh, you know cussedness. And if we educate these people, I think we can have a better thing. Uh, I'm sorry, I know um, I've spoken a little passionately uh, and therefore I've probably exceeded a little bit of time. Uh, my friend is already calling me on the other phone and telling me to wind down. So with these few words, let me end up. And uh, once again, thank. Looking forward eagerly to hear the Navy's point of view from uh, Rear Admiral Kapil. And I have to thank him actually for participating in our program, which he's doing for the first time. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Uh... The next speaker on the line as per the program is uh, Captain Imam uh, Imam Imam Parghat. Uh, he's an experienced uh, solver. Uh, a small uh, anecdote with respond to your uh, wake up call about IMDG. Uh, some years ago, uh, as our friend uh, Captain uh, Sagi has uh, narrated to me, uh, we all know there was a LPG carrier which ran aground of Ratnagiri while carrying the LPG to the Phenolux uh, plants. After running aground, you know what happens in the LPG carriers. The cooling systems were, uh, uh, you know, uh, running out. There was no way they, the LPG could be kept uh, cooled under uh, the re required the cryogenic uh, temperatures. And there was a big time bomb waiting to explode off uh, Ratnagiri. Luckily, it was in our territorial waters. And uh, Captain Sagi invoked uh, Article 356L and also 411 of MS Act. He requisitioned, uh, he requested them in first but they were refusing to give the vessel to evacuate this, uh, reduce the, you know, uh, lighten this vessel and uh, lighten this uh, liquefied uh, gases. And then he requisitioned, he used that MSAC very effectively, brought a vessel from Reliance, uh, reduced the, you know, draft of the vessel and the vessel was uh, floated off and safely it was uh, retrieved from there. It was a big salvage operation done by the, by the DG shipping without uh, causing any damage to either environment or to the, the population who were living on the coast. This was the way the MS Act could be used proactively for any uh, disaster which is about to happen, but there is no reference to the Ministry of Shipping or DG Shipping or any of these things in the National Disaster Management Plan. This is a, is a great job done by the DG Shipping at that time. They rose and 
saved you know lots of life and environment now i i invite uh, imam farhat he is a he is a member of uh, amici and uh, he is a uh, poor man is uh, waking up uh, somewhere in us houston maybe it is the middle of the night we thank him he is a uh, we are proud to say he is a direct cadet from shipping corporation of india and he has been in the maritime industry for the past 46 years he got his command he was working for uh, neptune orient lines of singapore and also he was uh, a key man i think probably is a serial uh, entrepreneur he set up american uh, eagle uh, tankers and he is manning uh, something called resolve which is a salvage company he is the right man he he want the asset for any salvage industry unless you have ideas in your mind it's not going to work unless somebody gives you the assets and equipment and trained manpower to go there and uh, salvage now i will request uh, imam farhad what he has to say about the indian preparedness for emergencies out at sea in our ec exclusive economic zone and uh, immediate uh, coastal zones thank you imam thank you uh, captain brankert uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen i do appreciate that i am getting this opportunity to speak to such esteemed seniors of course captain vivekanand captain suresh amirappu and so many familiar faces out there uh, good to see you all thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i cannot agree more to what captain suresh amirappu said and i have been trying my best going from pillar to post in the context of india to bring some or share some knowledge that i have experienced in my last 20 years 25 years uh from the other side of the ship that means on the management side or on the organization side working very closely with united states coast guard or with sosrep in uk or with the australia new zealand administration in handling emergencies i have i have uh, tabbed with the ministry of shipping in india and i am i would like to come back to this little later but let me go to my slide little bit though i was introduced in the beginning to respond and give my experience on a fire fighting experience that i had on neptune alexandrite but that's a very small matter in this context when uh, there are, there are much bigger uh, fish to fry here and i'm so very happy that i have some very important people here and if we can take this forward to any level it'll go a long way i have spoken a lot about it on different forums in india and i take this opportunity to speak again once again uh, can i have my slide is anybody there having it or can somebody allow me to share my screen then i can start the slide myself please uh, please uh, you know share your slide your your screen please share whatever you want and go ahead okay so i am going ahead with my slides and uh, yeah give me one second i'm just trying to so the topic that i want to refer to today is place of refuge it is very important for me to talk about place of refuge because that is very pertinent to what we are talking today and i hope we can take it to the next level uh, the unfortunate incident of mv express pearl which had a very short life uh, delivered on 10th of february 21 uh, came to the end on the 2nd of june unfortunately uh, it seems I, and i will go straight to the point it seems that when there was uh, some indication of smoke coming out the ship was denied entry in the port of hamad in qatar at port of hazira in india before coming to colombo where they didn't have a choice but to drop the anchor and request for assistance and where the whole story uh, uh, became bigger and today the ship is uh, destroyed Uh, it is a pity uh, the ship the ship though was supposed to 
be on a feeder fleet from Port Klang to Singapore to Jabal Ali to Hamad Port to Hazira to Colombo and back to Port Klang. Uh, it had done three voyages. This was the fourth one and it had a very unfortunate incident. Again, I have marked denied entry. It, it, it is a repetition of the incident of empty prestige. Most of the shippers, all of us are aware what happened to prestige when she had a ex small explosion on the starboard side and they, they went to the coast of uh, uh, Spain. They were in a small port in Galicia. They were not allowed to, to, to anchor or take care of the emergency. They tried to touch the coast of France and then to Portuguese, all these places. They were denied entry. And in fact, the particular navies, they asked them to leave the coast. Unfortunately, at last, on the 19th of November, she sank about 210 kilometers away from the coast. Unfortunately, 60,000 metric tons of heavy fuel oil was sunk. And these are just the two incidents just to bring the, into the limelight. But there are so many other incidents have happened where I'm sure that uh, the whole school of lawyers sitting in our panel here who know what is the importance of place of refuge. I don't want to take the light from uh, Admiral Kapil Gupta's talk, which has to follow, uh, but there is a lot to speak. Uh, of course, ships like Prestige have a class of ABS. They have the insurance, London PNI Club, uh, one of the um, international group of PNI clubs, respectable ones, and ABS almost went bankrupt, paying uh, for the penalty. Uh, and then right on the coast of India. So those happen, these are the two incidents. And then right on the coast of India where I myself was involved. And, and, and I, it was good to hear from IG Johnny uh, about the Amsterdam bridge. We were the uh, emergency response people from Resolve. And we did uh, fight the fire. Uh, Navy did a great job, uh, but the ship was stuck for four months. There was no reason for that. And once again, uh, thanks to our uh, senior administration who have more papers to fill than the actual job to do. The vessel Janessa had an emergency carrying uh, aircraft fuel uh, near, near the port of Kandla. And uh, Navy once again fought this fire along with a few porch uh, tugs. Uh, we were there to uh, stabilize the vessel. The crew was taken off. Uh, the ship was discharged. Fortunately, the weather was good, so we could do the STS operation and discharge the vessel. But this particular discharge or any response was a Herculean task to get any permission from the port, the Dayal port, that is Kandla. Again, an unfortunate incident that happened to Nushi Nalini. Everybody is aware of that, what happened in Cochin. I went per personally from pillar to post, again, from the chairman of the port to the deputy conservator to, to the, uh, uh, the MMD department, which is there in Cochin, and had numerous meetings to allow the vessel to just to come in for a day. She was carrying naphtha and she had a fire and the fire was extinguished with the help of the Navy and yet there was no success. Everybody just talked, but there was no response. So once again, all these are typical incidents for the Port of Refuge and being a marina and having gone through the maritime law where the Port of Refuge is such a, or a place of refuge is of such significance, uh, nobody pays importance to that. And only if we can do that, uh, there will be a huge uh, a favor done to the lives on board, to the environment, to the asset. Seeing so many incidents is just a quote from the prestige stuff. It says that it is now quite clear that if decisive action had been taken at an early stage to move the ship to a more sheltered location, the ship and its cargo would almost certainly have been saved and any pollution would have been minimal. So it's, it's, it's a known fact. So we must address to the port of refuge, place of refuge 
immediately. And before I end, I am, I am forced to say that as a consequence of any in, uh, incident like this, there are, in this particular case of Express Pearl, there was no loss of life. Uh, there will be cleanup cost, environmental disaster, of course, loss of asset, a huge asset, the brand new vessel with the millions dollar worth of cargo on board, all gone. And there will be serious legal consequences and owners and insurance to pay. Everybody's premium will go up and what have you. I Before I just close here, I just want uh, to thank Amici for everything what they are doing. In past six months, uh, uh, we have sat with Captain Pulat and Captain Venkat and the team, and there was a move of revising the MS Act, uh, of, of revisiting that. And uh, that happened. There were a lot of people who had worked on it, but I personally had met in the Ministry of Shipping with the Joint Secretary and the Additional Secretary. Uh, and I told them uh, with all the typical experiences of India, having, dis having responded uh, to the government of India uh, with the emergencies like the INS uh, Sindhu Rakshak that had an explosion uh, in, in, in Bombay. And we went there to pick up that submarine, uh, take out the bodies and give it respectfully to the Navy. Uh, to Amsterdam Bridge, to Nushi Nalini, to, to, to Janessa, to numerous other incidents, uh, small and big, that we have responded. And with that backing and seeing what is the administration there, it has been repeated so many times here that there is no, uh, there is no legislation guiding all this. And no better than having worked very closely since Exxon Valdez in 1989 in Alaska, I've worked very closely uh, with Open INT, Oil Pollution Act of 1990 in US and with source rape in UK. And most of the advanced countries have either taken one of these options uh, to implement in their country. India has a large host. We are seeing incidents just in the last couple of months with New Diamond, Express, Pearl, and what have you, and so many others right on our coast. Let us not wait for an Exxon Valdez to happen on the coast of India. Uh, for a major disaster to happen, though we have had a close calls with MSC Chitra and, and Nushi Nalini, which finally, after one year, was taken to Goa. And in the bad weather, she ran aground on the rocks right in front of the governor's house. And God help if something would have happened with the friction with Naptha on board, God knows. All the wise people sitting in this panel know what, can, what uh, could be the consequence. I just, at the end of the day, if we could all sit once again, and I don't know whatever happened to the MS Act that was revised and a lot of feedback was given by Amici, but definitely the procedure that was followed was not right in spite of me requesting them that please, in order to revise it, let us have a panel of wise professionals sit in a committee, prepare all the things in the industry that's going on and that needs to be corrected, be it commercial, be it manning, be it emergency response, and, and then go and make it in the legal wording. But it went the other way around. It was awarded to uh, the University of Nalsar, which is a law university. And they picked up the old MS Act and started correcting that. And then came to us to see what can be input. And that was a wrong move. Though we did our best to uh, uh, complement that or give the insight, I will leave that for Captain Pulat to fill in. But uh, the frustration is tremendous and we don't want to lose this team. We still have time to do something. Uh, let us do. I, I really uh, appreciate this panel. We have very wise people and senior people here, very effective. We need to really join hands and, and uh, approach the government to ensure that a very fruitful MS revised legislation is adopted and implemented. I fully agree with source rep model for India where there is one uh, uh, leader uh, who has got the knowledge, uh, not anybody, just because an administrative officer, no, you, you have to have a knowledgeable professional to take the lead who can take it for at least two, three years to start with the training exercises, drills, and then the implementation. With that, I thank everybody and thank you for your time. 
and for the patience, I pass on to Captain Ishwar Achanta. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Imam. Very kind of you. Uh, let me introduce uh, Ishwar Achanta. He's uh, one of our uh, MEC members. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a, he's, a, he's a sailor. He was at sea for a long time. Then he settled ashore and uh, he's running his own company called Portman. And he's also one of those uh, honorable members of uh, National uh, Shipping Board. He's doing a wonderful job on the waterfront. Uh, we welcome Ishwar Achanta. Ishwar, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Vaiket. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that promotion. Um, uh, as master, I never was. Spent a brief while at sea, Vaiket. But uh, thanks again. I feel really good to be called captain. I have a very specific and brief point to make today. I've heard uh, IG Donny, I've heard um, others as well on emergency response. And I'm going to restrict myself to this very short comment without going into the Indian Navy and Coast Guard protocols uh, on search and rescue and uh, assistance. And these are extraordinary as they have demonstrated time and again in rescuing us from so many disasters. So I, for the lack of any other word, Perhaps I should say the civilian policy document on search and rescue needs to be beefed up. And I say this from a personal experience uh, recently, when a ship of ours, a 14,000 deadweight MPV, left Kartupali port, and just outside the port, maybe about eight, nine nautical miles, she ran into a sandbank and was firmly grounded. So the head owners called us for assistance, and I got onto the blower and I spoke to the nearby ports, and I was... I won't use the word pleasantly, but I was very surprised to learn that none of these port tugs could put out to sea to assist the ship for the reason that um, though they were built under the MS, MS Act for ocean class and strength, their manning document prevented them from putting out to sea beyond the port limits. And therefore, they could not respond to, a, assist, respond to even a private um, you know, contract to go and assist the ship that had been grounded. So then we were told to get in touch with uh, the port, which had the ETV um, emergency vehicle uh, uh, vessel position there. And then again, we were pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised to be told that unless the vessel put out at the least a pan-pan call, the administration, and we didn't know which administration they were referring to, perhaps DG Shipping in uh, Mumbai, or uh, we, we had no clue. Only then the administration would consider um, putting this vessel out to sea to go and assist our vessel. So obviously the head owners um, had to take a call on it because everyone here knows the, the downside of putting out a pan-pan call or an emergency call, the liability regime that is attached to it. And, um, and the master uh, then uh, radioed back to us to say that he's going to wait uh, for 12 hours or two cycles of the tide to see whether he can use a kedge or whatever it is that he could do to float himself off. And fortunately for us, he floated himself off um, a day later, and uh, there was uh, there was no uh, damage to the hull, there was no spill, there was nothing. But this experience um, brought to light, in my personal opinion, um, a, a great loophole in attending to emergencies that need not always be a fire or an oil spill or something as you know big as this. There could be other emergencies as well that don't need. Uh, such uh, you know great response, but definitely do us need assistance uh, from the ports and from the administration. So I I don't know. I've been tracking this, but I don't see the situation having been changed. If it has changed, well and good for all of us who operate uh, smaller ships or who manage smaller ships uh, on our coast. If it hasn't changed, then I would commend this as a as an urgent requirement to attend to to MSC or any other body that has the wherewithal to take this up with the government of India. So this is something I just thought I would share with all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ishwar. I welcome uh, Rear Admiral Kapil Gupta, an experienced uh, veteran from the Indian uh, Navy. He has uh, a long uh, credit. He's, uh, he's from the NDA, and uh, he's in charge of uh, very many interesting activities for the Navy. He set up the, the Naval Academy, and he's also a team leader for various uh, projects. He's also involved with the 
salvage operations in India for some time and having worked with uh, Captain Imam Farhat uh, in the uh, Resolve uh, Enterprise. He's the right person to advise us on what is our emergency preparedness for uh, anything relating to sea and our exclusive economic zone and uh, slightly off the territorial waters of Hello. India, what is our preparedness. Welcome, uh, Rear Admiral Kapil Gupta. He's a, he's a, he's a decorated uh, soldier. He, he has got a Nausena medal. So over to Rear Admiral Kapil Gupta. Welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, Captain Venkat. And thank you to uh, Captain Kulat and uh, Captain Farad Imam for this opportunity to uh, speak here. I do not represent the Navy, <clears throat> though I speak in a manner that I feel is the Navy's view. Uh, we are very fortunate to be having this discussion in the aftermath of these two cyclones, the one on the West Coast, uh, Tute, and the one on the East Coast, Yas. Uh, four maritime incidents, most of which are directly related uh, to what we are discussing and the emergency response uh, to the accommodation barge P305, OSV Varaprada, and the emergency uh, Singapore registered Express Pearl that happened uh, of, of Colombo, which has been discussed enough. So rather than drawing from past uh, incidents, these recent developments give us an excellent backdrop uh, to, for our discussion today. For the sake of referencing, nobody has mentioned all this. Uh, you're all mariners, so you all know we have an over 7,500 kilometer uh, coastline, 2.3 million square kilometers of EZ. And if our claim for uh, the extended EZ is accepted, it would double our EZ. We have 300 islands uh, in the Andaman Nicobar. We have 36 islands in the Lakshadweep. It really extends our maritime area uh, in, in, in a big manner. The Indian Navy and in the Indian Coast Guard are uh, well-equipped maritime services. Uh, both have uh, clear and defined roles. Both are omnipresent within the vast area of responsibility, sometimes in the extending and extended and adjoining areas as well. Both have a peacetime role and a wartime role. During peacetime, their roles, apart from ensuring security, extends to providing relief during incidents that may occur at sea. Additionally, the Indian Navy also has the uh, role of uh, providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is uh, commonly known as HADR, uh, to not only within India, but also to, our, uh, to countries which are neighboring us in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. HADR has normally come about, has come about in the Indian, Indian context only after the tsunami hit us uh, several years ago. So like many other of our roles, HADR also requires the Navy to be prepared at all times. Uh, this also means carrying relief material on board. You may be at sea deployed somewhere and an emergency occurs somewhere and you need to provide uh, humanitarian aid in, in another country. Uh, you don't come back to port. You are already embarked with uh, something called BRICS uh, I'll come to bricks later, but you, every ship that leaves its port carries a certain number of bricks so that in the eventuality of uh, providing HADR uh, assistance anywhere, she can be deployed straight away without having to come to harbor. During the two recent cyclones, one each on the west and east coast, very little damage was caused ashore because the Med Department gave adequate and enough warning in terms of time and in terms of geographical limits. And uh, the, the uh, uh, administration ashore could evacuate, could move people away, could protect property, etc. However, um, at sea, that did not happen. And um, uh, there was major havoc in the, uh, of the Bombay High. Uh, despite the fact that from the 11th of May, the Indian Med Department had put out a warning, plodding a track of Tote right across the uh, Bombay High. I recall that late uh, 90s, uh, when we used to, when there used to be cyclones, we were, the Navy and the Coast Guard would be deployed after the cyclone had cleared off to go and uh, rescue people and property. And I remember that when we used to be go, go out to sea, there used to be fishing boats uh, overturned, damaged, 
uh, bodies strewn all over the sea because in those days we did not have uh, good met uh, warnings available and fishermen uh, would never know when a cyclone was developing however in this particular case the coast guard did an excellent job by making sure that every fisherman at sea was um, um, uh, you know sent off back to their port so that there was no loss of life with such predictability disasters at sea due to cyclones etc should be a thing of the past but it is not accidents will of course occur and these have to be handled as they happen but accidents are not because of natural uh, calamities despite the excellent predictability and warning we had the p305 vara prada gal contractor and a few others uh, who either ran ran aground sank or at least dis- press the distress button there were a couple of them in the south gujarat coast which had to be provided assistance so every response has to have has a solution and the solution is based on the incident, the the environment as it exists over there in our waters the first responder as everybody is brought out is uh, generally the coast guard and the navy if is an incident occurs in the port limits then of course the port uh, is there to react uh, they may be better placed to respond in the iron and the coast guard the first responder they are the first responders because they are deployed at sea at all times it's their job to be at sea and uh, they are there at sea they can rush to that spot and uh, react uh, to the incident the arrival of an aircraft on scene uh, gives a great relief uh, our aircraft arrives always earlier and it can give a great sense of relief to the crew that they have been spotted they know uh, what is happening the people ashore the dg shipping ministry etc all the authorities the multifarious authorities in india who control all these activities can be given a realistic picture of what what the situation is uh, at sea in the recent case uh, vessel that sank or ran aground the navy uh, followed by the coast guard were the first responders uh, regrettably uh, nearly 100 lives were lost uh, but on the positive side um, uh, more than 500 were rescued and uh, when i finish uh, and what i propose uh, as a solution to our problem i would like that these 86 to 90 people whose lives have been lost during the cyclone torte their lives their loss of life should not go in vain in every country countries have reacted to incidents we have not unfortunately but it is now time that let the lives of these people um uh, shake us up to uh, to you know uh, do something about the system that exists while the coast guard and uh, ships are partially equipped uh, to respond to fires oil spills etc as was brought out by ig donny michael indian uh, indian naval ships can provide better rescue facilities and uh, they have better med- medical facilities on board the ships as also the aircraft on scene can provide better perspective to the people ashore to know what is happening many decades ago there was an incident uh, in the bombay high uh, uh, it was i think in the eight, uh, early 80s when one of the um, uh, oil rigs caught fire there was a blow out sagar vikas or sagar ratna and we were there at sea for nearly four days we had no capability in the navy was there but we had no capability to help them there were two offshore support vessels which were spewing water over the uh, fire but uh, nothing uh, substantial was happening finally a um, gentleman called red uh, henry red adair he was known as red adair he was uh, requisitioned from the us brought in flown into our ship then we transferred him to he and his team and equipment onto the the oil rig and then he carried out the capping of the um, you know the blow out similarly in the late 90s there was a cyclone in the gulf of khambat which uh uh the the size of the waves carried six ships onto the river and when the water receded they had run aground 15 ships uh, were uh, sank in the gulf of khambat more than 1000 lives were lost so we have come a long way from this uh, you know 1982 1998 etc and in 2021 despite adequate warning we still we still lost a lot of lives 
Captain Imam brought out the uh, incident of Exxon Valdez um, in Alaska in 1989. By 1990, the US government had enacted the Oil Pollution Act. It's called the OPA 90. It was enacted within one year. Similarly, in the UK, the SOSREP was uh, enacted when an incident happened. In the New Zealand, in, in Australia, they, they enacted their laws uh, to tackle to the, these situations when something drastic happened. Uh, we also need to take a lead from there. We have SOSREP and OPA 90 to you know, lean on and define a system which is suitable to us. Unfortunately, despite the many incidents along our long coastline, the vast sea areas, uh, we, we are still far away from a proper legislation. We do have legislations, as was brought out by various speakers earlier, but we do not have a proper legislation. I come back to MT Genesa, um, highlight a little more than what Captain Imam said. Um, the entire team was there within 36 hours of uh, the you know, explosion having taken place in the engine room. The port had deployed enough tugs over there. They were trying to you know, put water into the engine room. They flooded the engine room. The ship was sitting by its stern. But it took two weeks, two weeks for the vessel to be handed over to the salvers who were sitting over there from 36 hours onwards. Why did it take 30, uh, two weeks? The ship was hitting with 30,000 tons, 40,000 tons of uh, fuel. Anything would have happened. She could have toppled, turned over. The, there would have been a huge disaster. But it took two weeks because the port authorities did not, did not want to hand over the ship till they were assured of their compensation. Amsterdam Bridge, Mumbai Harbor, again being uh, highlighted over here. Uh, I'll just say that it took four months for the ship to be released and sent off. In that period, anything could have happened. We are pure lucky that, you know, these delays of ours have not uh, uh, led to disasters. Though, as Captain Imam brought out, no, she, Nalini, she went and ran aground in Goa. So, in, in, in both these cases of Genesa and uh, uh, Amsterdam Bridge, it was the port authorities that did the initial response. And of course, the Coast Guard was there. Uh, in, in, bo in both the incidents, the Coast Guard was there. In both the cases, it was the port authorities that either did not take adequate decisions or did not take it fast enough, or there were other factors which I am not aware of. But uh, there were delays, and delays could have caused a problem. Each incident, uh, including the current ones, have led to inquiries, investigations, the analyses will be drawn, lessons will be learned and promulgated. But what clearly emerges from every incident is that there is no centralized responsible decision-making authority, responsible decision-making authority, which can react and control the initial incident till the owners, the insurers, the salvers, etc. take over. There is no central authority that has a wherewithal to react to these emergencies. Even, even if there was an authority, they do not have the resources required to react. And most importantly, there is a huge effort towards domain protection. Domain protection. Finally, and this is not recorded anywhere, I already mentioned it uh, very briefly, that it is the ports who are reluctant because of the efforts that they have put in. See, the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard, though they may get compensated subsequently by the, uh, during the salvage claim, but they do not, they do not ask for upfront uh, money that has been spent on, of their resources to be given back only then it can go further, while the ports do that. So what should be the ideal response mechanism? which suits the Indian environment. I think there is an authority that is required, which is autonomous, which is responsible, and which is accountable. Responsible and accountable. A lot of people have talked of uh, you know, authority, but nobody has used these other two words of responsibility and accountability. There is no point having an authority which is not responsible and which is not accountable for its actions. It's like the captain of the ship. He's responsible for everything. He's accountable for everything. So there is a need for an improved legislation. The existing legis legislation, it has been proved, is inadequate. 
it should vest authority responsibility and accountability its direction should be binding on all organizations whichever are the organizations that are is, uh, responsible or involved in providing uh, in responding to an emergency at sea must be under this authority for that moment i don't mean at all times for that moment an sop which is existing in the dg shipping manuals on how to react to a Uh, to an emergency is grossly inadequate several players like the indian navy are not even part of the crisis um, group that has been set up by uh, that gets set up by dg shipping and as i mentioned the opa 90 and sosrep are uh, documents that we can you know lean on uh, to draft our own uh, uh, our own uh, legislation it's an idea which is not uh, out of the box it has been proposed for several years as captain imam also brought out he has been knocking the doors of uh, the uh, ministry of shipping on this aspect uh, set up an authority i mera is one suggestion that could be any name given to it why did legislative powers provided infrastructure and funding akin to the international oil compensation fund for the authority and its infrastructure the iron and coast guard in the navy and the coast guard have been the first responders to any maritime incident they have hordes of experience one of the two must lead the authority not sure what structure the maritime command which is likely to be announced in the very near future is uh, going to take place that will only come out with the announcement but it will surely be responsible for the security and safety of the entire sea area around us maybe the answer lies in vesting the powers with that authority like the ndma the armed forces and every other organization that is required to react to emergencies the, this authority must have some reactive capability in terms of infrastructure the minimum infrastructure that i feel should be couple of tugs two tugs maybe stand by on the west coast two on the east coast um fifi capable owned chartered for the monsoon period well these things could be worked out whether they are chartered or owned but it should not be that you identify a tug and then let it let it out into the um, commercial world and then when you require an incident uh, react to an incident of mangalore the tug is deployed in the gulf of kambat uh, uh, not not possible then i talk to bricks bricks are basically pre defined uh, uh, you know set of equipment or in the case of hadr it is rations Uh, but in the case of um, what we are discussing a brick would be a set of equipment that can be decided by experts so you carry one brick or two bricks load them carry them away the brick size could be such that a helicopter could deliver it on on scene the brick size size could be such that it could be loaded on on the uh, uh, tugs which are there in port and be deployed and these bricks could be kept in various warehouses in various places uh they easily deployable from a warehouse ashore lift and move capability assist in providing initial response i already told you brick in terms of the indian uh, uh, hadr at the international level all companies subscribe to the international oil compensation fund in india we do have a system where all the oil companies contribute towards offshore defense this is and this is a, a huge amount of money had been collected and very recently couple of years ago the patrol boats for the offshore defense were pr procured by the government of india through this fund so i suggest a small levy of 1 rupee for every metric ton of cargo that is handled and at the uh, in the current year we are handling or la last year we handled 1500 uh, met million metric tons so that could mean about 150 crores every year increasing as we increase our capacity to 2500 metric tons uh, million metric tons and 3000 metric million metric tons by 2025 25 2020 30 etc and so this amount of money 150 crores 1 200 crores 300 crores every year could be utilized to build up this infrastructure to Uh, to maintain it to you know refurbish it etc etc that's a lot of money it can uh, can be utilized very well the tugs could also be funded from this so to conclude i would say let's set up an authority give it legislative powers provided the infrastructure uh, funding via small ses um, either the iron or the coast guard could be the leader the maritime command which is likely to be set up soon could be the answer thank you very much
thank you uh, thank you rear admiral kapil saab excellent uh, we thank you for your participation and the valuable inputs you have given for this uh, uh, situation how to handle it in case of a disaster and the exclusive economic zone of india now i just wondering as you are uh, speaking is wondering if there is a, a blow in one of those uh, you know, platforms uh, a, a serious condition where you don't have equipment to handle as you admitted that indian navy or the coast guard may not have the right kind of equipment a vessel is requisition uh, coming from overseas maybe from the gulf it is mobilized coming to the uh, oil field so the situation is whether they should enter bombay port to get customs cleared and immigration cleared and then proceed to the offshore site or they can reach the offshore side directly there is no link for this emergency situations we had suggested to incorporate such provisions in the merchant shipping act when an emergency like this were to happen the dg shipping which is the uh, maybe the first point of contact in kind of uh, situations like this oh, hurry, will be able to will be able to uh, get this uh, permissions uh, as a one time effort everything can be cleared the equipment and the material reaches the site and starts handling the emergency situation we do not know what will happen in the ms bill or any other act which will have this uh, emergency provisions to be handled by the single nodal agency as you are telling the maritime command or indian maritime emergency uh, authority will be able to coordinate and give one time solution as single handedly understanding the situation with responsibility and accountability now uh, i welcome the the vice chancellor of uh, indian maritime university Uh, the most knowledgeable person amongst the group with a wide exposure and experience she has handled all the subjects first hand as the director general of shipping for government of india and uh, she is also the national shipping board uh, present uh, chairman she is the vice chancellor of a university and an accomplished person uh, academically and as well as professionally and uh, she needs no further introduction everybody has interacted with her everybody has met her uh, we welcome dr Malini Shankar IAS retired uh, over to you madam thank you captain uh, venkat iyer um very very and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my views on the subject and felicitations to mcr for organizing such an informative webinar such great speakers to listen to i'm going to start if you will give me some time to start with the experience i had uh, on you know with the oil spill outside a north port and that is my real insight uh, it's like plunging into the deep waters and learning what an oil spill is about and how we go about managing the disaster and i have three points to two major points to make on it one is the awareness and two is the coordination issues when the oil spill occurred not i mean there were very few people leave the coast guard alone they are the first ones on the spot but the rest of them there was very little awareness about the uh, sops in fact we could not trace the sops and it was less because the cargo which was being carried belonged to the petroleum ministry the petroleum ministry actually gave the mmds the sops so that is a level of the awareness now there was regarding equipment uh, Uh, there, there was no ready to retrievable inventory of equipment, and where there was, it was retrievable. The inventory, uh, the equipment, they didn't know where it was. And when the equipment was finally found, the person who knew how to operate the equipment was missing. And when they wanted to buy additional equipment, they did not. There was no ready list of where they can go and source on an urgent basis. buy this equipment and we are talking about booms you know simple as that we are not going into skimmers and things like that so this is the awareness part the second is coordination uh, at the cost of perhaps i don't mean to hurt anybody but there was a lot of turf protection there was a law for more for emphasis was on who will communicate and who will take the credit for this and this is every single agency which was there on the field the national agencies as well as the local state government agencies there was more effort put into that as much effort put into that as the real dealing with the disaster there was no disaster management plan that was there that so these are the two things very briefly a third is we are speaking about special legislation for this 
I would like to impress upon the stakeholders and the experts that I think as a country, we are over legislated. We cannot have legislation for each thing. There is a disaster management act, which is uh, all encompassing. And more than the legislation or the legislative enabling provisions, it is the implementation where we lack. And that's why I focused on where is the awareness and where is the coordination? So it is enforcement of those provisions rather than having special legislations. The Disaster Management Act, as you can see in recent times, gives adequate powers to whoever is in place to actually enforce it, but it is not enforced. That's my third point. Um, and uh, as far as what should be done, a few recommendations. The disaster management plan is expected to be in place at the level of every organization. It's, I know there are, in, you know, not about ports, but, you know, look at my own university. They thought the disaster management plan prepared by the collector is sufficient and they don't have to prepare anything else. Every single organization needs to have a disaster management plan, which is dovetailed and accepted by the district administration. Now, this is mostly cut, paste, copied. It's on paper, it's sitting in libraries, and nobody has read it if there exists one. Second is there is no, there is a, you know, whether it is fire or whether it is oil spill, there needs to be a drill, very periodic drill, which is taken, which takes place in the armed forces, which takes place, but it is ignored by every single organization, including the ports. And I'm making a statement here because the ports at that point of time this was january 2017 the port simply had not had a drill for oil spill or emergency or any disaster in the previous year so the dg office actually got into the act and had to nudge the ports remember the dg shipping does not control the ports now there are structural issues that people have to understand so we had to nudge the ports to have one an inventory of equipment to the disaster management plan, three of where the equipment will be available, and four a periodic uh, drill. This is not done by every single organization. A third is there needs to be more than the legislation, there need to be refresher and updation workshops. Uh, at the end of this, we decided that you know there was a lot of ignorance or lack of awareness about these things. So including insurance people. Uh, they didn't know that our insurance agents, uh, agencies in India who are aware of hell, hull insurance, but very, very weak on PNI insurance. So we had to conduct a workshop where we actually called uh, um, uh, representatives of international agencies like ITOPF and you know uh, the Oil Pollution Fund people. And it was this kind of workshop has to take place every six months because people change, people retire, people get transferred, uh, and uh, they, they, or, or, you know, there has to be refresher. It's there in every single, uh, you know, profession. We don't do this. We don't insist on this. Even the best of stakeholders and exports don't suggest this. Instead of suggesting legislation, which may or may not be necessary, I think these are the things which have to be ensured. My next two points, very briefly, are. Uh, Suggesting, yeah, an IMIRA or an agency like that, yes, it can be explored, but there is a specialized agency it's called the NDMA. A multiplication of agencies is not going to help this country. Maybe NDMA has to have a separate vertical, which is, um, you know, related to the maritime sector. Because right now, the NDMA is the one which, along with the SDMA, which is the State Disaster Management Authority, they are on the field immediately. If Coast Guard is going to be, Coast Guard is the critical uh, factor, but it has to be dovetailed to NDMA. Even if you create an IMERA, you, there will be a gap between the coordination of within the sector and coordination with the NDMA and SDMA and state agencies. Uh, and my last point in response to Rear Admiral Kapil, Kapil Gupta on the tugs. Now, there, there was a provision to place a truck on the west coast for three months of the monsoon and the east coast for three months of the monsoon on the east coast, the northeast monsoon. What we observed in the last five years, previous five years, this was a decision taken in 2018, uh, is that 
Um, the monsoon is no longer due to climate change issues. The monsoon is no longer limited to three months on the west coast and three months, the designated three months on the east coast. For example, the cyclone Oki, which hit Kerala, hit beyond the monsoon period. And the cyclones which were hitting the east coast came before the northeast monsoons. So we said this cannot be three months plus three months. It has to be year round. And um, the experiment of having a tugboat to be placed, it was placed only in one or two places. And if there was an emergency in Kolkata, and if there is a, the tugboat is in Mumbai, you can imagine how long it takes for that tugboat to reach Kolkata. So we said that there has to be year-round tugboats. So what was put in place was a mechanism where one port on the west coast and one port on the east coast will acquire by purchase or lease a tugboat and the DG shipping will give an annuity for five years, which covers the purchase cost over the five years. The tugboat will be in place in the, uh, uh, in the concerned port. And the first instance, it was uh, Mumbai port and Chennai port. Uh, and they could use it because it belongs to the port. They could use it for their own purposes, which is how so it actually increases the efficiency of the use of the tugboat. They could use it for their own purposes with the rider that whenever it was required for towing purposes in an emergency, they would have to release it along with the manpower and they have to operate it under the control or instructions of the government of the D or the DBS as the case may be. And in phase two, it was, uh, I, I have not kept track of this. Phase two, it was expected two more ports, perhaps Cochin port and Paradeep or Kolkata port will have these tugs. So you will have two tugboats on each of the coast and this will be available for emergency operations for year round, not just for three months and three months. That's old hat and that will not work under the changed climate change uh, uh, situation. There are a few other things, you know, I don't know what is the situation now, but in 2018, when I visited the Paradeep port, the Coast Guard ship, brand new one was there, but it could not be operated because there were no people, no trained persons to operate. So the reason I'm saying this is not to criticize any agency. All of us work under the government and we work under several restrictions. But it is the enforcement of the SOPs, the knowledge of the SOPs, the enforcement of the SOPs, and immense coordination that is required without a turf protection game. So that is where the situation is. And I would say that we work within these parameters and framework to see how we can actually improve the disaster management prevention plan as well as the post event management plan. I'm open to suggestions, so constructive suggestions, uh, which do not um, duplicate or multiply the agencies and the, and the legislations, because that is not something that the government might consider very, um, uh, you know, uh, very favorably. But yes, the National Shipping Board can, this is a very important uh, topic for the National Shipping Board to take us, take its uh, advisory role seriously and, and send its recommendations to the government. That is, that is an assurance. So thank you for uh, giving me the time and the opportunity to share my views. Thank you, Captain Iger. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Malini Shankar. Uh, we appreciate your uh, comments and suggestions. Uh, what we would like to say is the National Disaster Management Act is a very old act and national disaster management plans have been upgraded from 2016 to 2019, yet there is no connect between the uh, seaward disasters and the national management plan. And as NSB, we would like you to you know, take it up uh, with the sure. appropriate authorities and include, as you suggested, a vertical in the you know, national disaster plan. Uh, with all the SOPs and the equipment to be used by, by cooperating with the uh, Indian Navy and in the Indian uh, Coast Guard who have perhaps uh, some kind of an equipment at least and uh, some kind of dedicated and trained manpower to handle the situation. This should be incorporated in the National Disaster Management Plan uh, rather than looking at uh, spontaneous uh, decisions when an incident happens to move uh, yeah. forward. So this will be a good suggestion maybe as you rightly said NSB can look into it at least now after about you know 10 years or 15 years of uh, national disaster management plan has been in force. And uh, as you Otlo rightly said, there is no point in increasing the, the number of uh, enactments. It's rightly said, it's correct. Uh, we also would like to see as a mariner, 
uh, we have this anti aircraft hijacking act but we don't have anything like anti uh, hijacking of uh, ships at sea if what happens if a ship is hijacked by the terrorist or by uh, you know uh, uh, another revolutionary people or by pirates there is no act for the indian government to step on board this vessel and rescue our mariners whereas we have got after about 11 or 13 uh, hijacking of indian aircraft we have we have enacted this anti uh, act, aircraft hijacking act so there itself we can add one more chapter nsb can suggest add one more chapter for anti hijacking of vessels in the high seas how india will intervene and uh, salvage our indian asset and also uh, rescue our indian uh, seafarers thank you now i request uh, Uh, okay, Captain. Uh, I, I just like to add that the National Disaster Management Act is not very old. It's just it, it's a National Shipping Act which is too old. It is 1958, and this one is 2005, and it's been modified from time to time. So, but yes, there it, it's a it's perhaps a work in progress, and there can be suggestions to include certain you know to integrate with the coast and the maritime uh, areas. thank you madam you are the in the right place uh, you can think both sides and you will be able to uh, marinate both and create a vertical so that the the management plan uh, envisages all the situations and gives power to a single authority with knowledge and dedicated uh, experience to handle such situations which is missing in the national disaster management plan even in the 2019 edition there is no mention about this areas of uh, activity thank you uh, i request uh, neil j nayar uh, is also a member of uh, the amici group and he is a deep thinker and a very very good person with uh, handling experience in the offshore uh, east coast i request neil j nayar to summarize the the second portion of the uh, webinar neil thank you captain venkat uh, i think it's been pretty pretty interesting really very good presentations made by uh, all the speakers we had a very elite panel uh, I think there were lots of good inputs from Captain Ayer, Venkat Ayer, uh, Inspector General Donny Michael, uh, Captain Suresh Amirapu, Captain Parath Imam, Mr. Ishwar Achanta, Rear Admiral Kapil Gupta, and of course our very own Mrs. Malini Shankar. Uh, they all touched upon extremely pertinent points to do with our readiness and our capabilities and weaknesses in responding to disaster management. on the maritime sector they all brought out through the very lucid examples of where we messed up uh, the kind of problems that we faced including the bureaucratic and legal problems and uh, since we are short of time now and we are running out of time we still have a question and answer session to go i'll just try to bring out a few commonalities among the various presentations to kind of uh, determine say five or six key areas that we need to focus on to kind of redress the situation and move on to better days ahead uh, one deficiency that seemed to consistently come across was that there's been a a kind of compartmentalization in our decision making process uh, in any disaster too many different parties getting involved uh, multiple power centers lack of adequate knowledge by each power center on the totality of the challenge being faced and hence delays in making decisions like as captain uh, venkat put whether a ship should clear customs in bombay before it goes to ratnagiri to put off a fire or uh, whether like for example um, dr malni brought out the issue of the gon kanchi pur uh we had over 15 key departments in the state and center involved in the overall cleanup efforts uh, my company happened to be the overseeing authority in behalf of the penai club which did the final clean up and there were huge number of issues that we faced uh, which were sorted out one by one as we went along and once the entire clean up operation was over uh, we had this whatsapp group where everybody was part of and dr malni shankar rightly brought it out the brought out the various deficiencies and issues that we faced during the clean up operations so finally i suggested that before we wind up the group could we all meet together to at least document the issues that we faced and then kind of put a road map to how we are going to solve it so that it doesn't happen the next time around that we are better prepared uh, unfortunately 80% of those members in the whatsapp group exited the group the same day so i think there is a there is a, a kind of 
characteristic Indian characteristic in moving from one crisis to another without resolving any. Uh, before we resolve one, we are into another and we never get the time to document, learn from and make changes to prevent similar things happening. So it's, we never learn from history to say it shortly. The second aspect is that uh, in any, like we see on ships, we have a very lateral uh, management policy on ships where every individual on the ship has their area of responsibility which they take care of. But when it comes to a contingency, the entire management structure becomes vertical and hierarchical because you cannot have a lateral management leadership style in a contingency. You need somebody on top to decide and execute. Similar in case of contingencies, as uh, IG Don, uh, Donnie brought out and Mr. Mali Shankar brought out, we need a structure where we need a source rep like organization, a single source rep who's the head of the decision making body with a key team of experts from different ministries who will form immediately on a contingency happening. And this source rep will be empowered to overrule every other department in the government of India, whether it's customs, whether it's immigration, whether it's ports, whether it's uh, pollution control, environmental ministry, because experts from each of these ministries will be part of his core team, managing the contingency, single point of command and control. And uh, this needs to be brought into the National Disaster Management Plan, where we need to have a very good management structure in place. And lastly, as allocation of resources. Uh, IG Donnie again brought out that we had three uh, vessels like the Sagar Samrika, I think, uh, which is, and they are capable of handling a thousand, two thousand to five thousand ton oil spills on the Indian coast. We are talking of two hundred thousand ton oil spills. Do we even have a contingency plan to handle such spills? I think it's time that uh, all the thinkers involved today, many more were not here. We need to put our heads together. We have learned a lot from today's sessions. It's time to come out with solutions and move on to a more organized response when the next contingency comes across. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, a, a great uh, summing up. Let me introduce uh, Captain Kamal Chadda. Uh, he's from the Marex Media, a senior uh, mariner amongst us. Uh, he's a supportive of uh, many such uh, ventures and uh, he's uh, one of the uh, strong guides of Amici. He's a member. I over to and over to Kamal Chadda for uh, question and answers if he has collected any. Thank you. Over to Kamal. Thank you very much, Venkat. Uh, looks like all the questions have gotten answered already. Uh, all the questions that uh, I have been looking at, uh, I noticed that uh, you have spoken on the subject in depth. So uh, I think we're having a, a time overrun over here. So if any questions do come up, we take them up and pass them by email on to the uh, relevant uh, responders. And uh, we'll take it accordingly. So I think uh, I will uh, turn the mic uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Kamal. Uh, now over to Captain uh, Ramakrishnan. He is our uh, founder uh, treasurer. He is running his uh, business Benline Agencies. He has a lot of experience uh, in dealing with the emergency preparedness. He has handled a lot of vessels which came for salvage all by himself. I request him to propose the vote of thanks for all those who have attended this uh, webinar. Uh, over to Ram. Ram, are you there? Okay, thank you. Ram is missing. Uh, Suri, uh, please propose word of thanks and close the meeting, uh, and you can sum up. Uh, Venkat, actually, we changed that. Uh, Raj Gopal there? Raj Gopal is not there. Is it okay? No problem. Uh, he just proposed, yeah. Uh, no problem. Actually, it's been uh, a little longer than we thought, but the time was worth it. I would say that because, you know, about the 99 we had when we started, it has not gone down before uh, below 86 now, which means people are committed to the cause. That is more important. 
and I must thank for a lot of comments posted. Uh, of course, very few questions because the speakers, I suppose, were very good and they cleared all the doubts in their speak. Of course, we have a little bit of, uh, I won't say disagreement or misagreement, areas to be sorted out how the hierarchy can work better with resources and management, like Neil was saying, uh, probably a vertical management is called for. It cannot be lateral or horizontal when in disaster, there is no time. So once again, thank you to all of you for staying back so long and all the speakers, participants, specialists, invitees, and from Navy, Coast Guard, this is Malini Shankar. In fact, uh, I hope we haven't delayed you for too long because we didn't expect to go so long. It's almost a one hour plus. So we will have the next uh, webinar in the first week of uh, July 3rd, I think. That will be on mariners' welfare. Believe it or not, we will turn the world upside down. It's not the way the industry runs because the other day we heard about Wallam's manager saying seafarers are scum of the world. They should go on strike all over the world. I think it has reached the limit. It's high time we have a respectable pos uh, position in, in the land when we land a show. And let's do something about it. Already Venkat and me have been working on it and we promise that we have a lot of amendments to merchant shipping bill, which Malini Shankar has pointed out. Uh, it is outdated. We'll work on it. Thank you very much. You're all welcome to chat or send me a mail or call me uh, anytime with any inputs on this or with ideas for the future. Here is Captain Pullet signing off. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Before, before, we, be, before we close the session, I wish to place on record our sincere thanks to Kirtan Vakil and uh, Sanjeev Vakil for enabling this platform as usual. And they're also, all of them are awake and all of them are standing behind as a, as a, as a back and, uh, back and uh, you know, engineers to help us out in case of any glitch. And uh, the whole presentation uh, for the media and uh, Captain Kamal Chadda for, uh, you know, taking it across to everybody and our senior most person, Captain Vivekanand, to be present and uh, helping us out in the, the whole uh, thought process. We thank uh, HIMT for the sponsorship. We thank one and all. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, is recording is available. Thank you. Bye.